Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates semi-centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm so very happy to welcome Marcus Gorman back to the podcast today to talk about Carnal Knowledge, directed by Mike Nichols and starring Jack Nicholson, released 50 years ago on June 30th, 1971. How are we doing, Marcus? We're doing fabulous. How are you? Doing well. Thanks so much for coming back. Uh, we have two talks we've had on the podcast so far. We talked about Brewster McLeod, <laughs> directed by Robert Altman. That's a really fun one. Go find that. Check it out. We also talked about Charlie Chaplin's The Kid back in February. You can find that on YouTube. Today, we're talking about Carnal Knowledge, starring Mr. Jack Nicholson. This is at the beginning of his long film career. What's kind of been your relationship, Marcus, with the films of Jack Nicholson? I'm born in 82, so by okay. the time I know about him, like, the first major thing is Batman. I'm, I'm six seven, I'm six years old when that comes out, Yeah, because um, I'm a November baby, and everything kind of it branches out from there. So I don't know him as, like, a 70s guy until yeah. <laughs> until way later. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, I know him through Batman and then, like, A Few Good Men, and then when I mm -hmm. get of age, I get to see his older films. I get yeah. to I get to see The Shining. I get to see Chinatown. I'm a huge Hal Ashby fan, so The Last Detail. Okay. Uh, it's very near and dear to me. Um, and, and Robert Town, screenplay, who also wrote Chinatown. Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, saw Easy Rider. My, um, I was in film club, and we had, um, it's the vice principal. He was the dean of students at my high school, and he had a bunch of laser discs and lent me like American Graffiti and Easy Rider. And Easy Rider, baby, is not a laser disc you want to hand to a 15, 16 year old, <laughs> but this is Berkeley, California, so that's okay. And my, my parents, my, my, my parents' first date was taxi driver. So, I mean, I'm in good company with, with, <laughs> with people. So, like, th there's nothing I couldn't watch. Um, and then uh, my, my family, and I especially love James O. Brooks. So, for a while, I just know him in smaller roles in terms of endearment uh, and broadcast news. Yep. But only later do I sort of get into his his older stuff, like Five Easy Pieces, um, his work with Roger Corman, and then becoming, um, as as Mike Nichols would say, uh, the 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 best actor since Brando. Yeah, we talked about him on our Five Easy Pieces episode. That was the very first episode of the podcast with a guest, and interestingly. Jack Nicholson, he started acting in film all the way back in 1959. I always assumed he maybe had done a couple little things, but that Easy Rider was kind of his first major film. And like, like he was in a lot of stuff for about 10 years, some stuff for uh, Roger Corman. He showed up in this, like, I think it was a Vincent Price movie I watched in one of the Scream Factory <laughs> Blu-rays, yeah. like an early 60s film. And there's Nicholson, like handsome as ever. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he's in like, yeah, he's um, in these cheesy horror films from the early 60s, like Little Shop of Horrors. Is from 1960. <laughs> so yeah, he was acting. I don't know if he's ever going to act again, Marcus, but his last credit is James L. Brooks again, right? And how how do you, we know? How do you know from 2010 with Reese Oh my Lutherman? God, that was after The Departed. You're right. Yeah. I had no idea he hadn't acted since then. It, it didn't even, I didn't even think about this because like three weeks ago, I saw a photo of him like, in a hot tub inside of a lake with a bunch of very young women. And I thought, this guy still has it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I guess he's done. Um, and I also saw, going back to one of his earlier films, I recently uh, watched uh, Head, the Monkeys film, yes. which he mm -hmm. co wrote um, with them and the director. They all just went to the woods and got really freaking blasted for two days and wrote the whole thing. <laughs> and the movie, feels like they just wrote it blasted out of their minds um which is quite enjoyable if that's your kind of thing it is mine but it's <laughs> far and away not at all like the tv show that they were making fun of yeah that was on an excellent uh, criterion collection box set i think it was called the bbs story and yep. the first disc was head and yeah, you even see, you even see nicholson briefly in the movie too right like he shows up like in a shot or something but that's rafelson right rafelson directed yep. that so that was yeah. an important film for nicholson to come on board because then rafelson would cast him in five easy pieces and and, and that and was like just a breakthrough terrific lead performance in a movie that he had had not had before Right. Totally, yeah. Rafelson made all this money with his partners on the monkeys and then kind of recreated American cinema. Not really intentionally. He was just doing whatever he wanted. He <laughs> yeah. had the money to do so, and now we revere the 70s. Holy yeah. Crap. 
And so I think when people think of Jack Nicholson in the 70s, they think about One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, Chinatown, maybe The Last Detail. I'm not sure how many people immediately go to Carnal Knowledge from 71. It's obviously a very important film in the careers of a lot of actors in this movie and in the career of Mike Nichols watching this movie for the very first time. I thought I had seen it before. I told you before I started recording and I'm like, I have not seen this. This is brand new to me. So yeah, and, and knowing kind of Mike Nichols' other films, he made his first film, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and then Closer in the 2000s. And then like, oh, there's this kind of fits in his filmography in a really interesting way. Uh, very much. He is, we'll get to it later, but he's one of the few directors to really get uh, turning theater into cinema mm -hmm. because Carnal Knowledge was um, sent to him by Jules Pfeiffer as a play called yep. True Confessions. And Mike Nichols says, no, no, I really want close-ups. I want to hold the shot on these people. I want to see their expressions. I want to see them listen. Please let me turn this into a film. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll get into all that. I, before we get started, I wanted to share with our listeners just a very brief summary of what this movie's about. So as I said, Jack Nicholson, he had five easy pieces the year before. He gets nominated for an Academy Award in early 71. And then he's in a couple things in 71. There's a, like a obscure film. It was also on the BBS collection called A Safe Place. And then he directed a film in 71. What was it called? <laughs> Drive, oh, he know. said. So I think it's called Drive, he said, or something like that. And, but this was kind of his next major project, Cornell Knowledge, which came out in the summer of 71. Uh, so this film tells of two male friends, Jonathan, played by Jack Nicholson, and Sandy, played by Art Garfunkel, <laughs> and their romantic es escapades over the course of many years. The film is kind of told in three segments, something I was not aware of as I started watching the movie. Uh, we open the story in their college days where Sandy and Jonathan both date an idealistic young woman named Susan, played by Candace Bergen, and kind of creates a little love triangle there that adds some kind of tension in the early part of the movie. Susan eventually making her choice as to which man she wants to be with. So after college, Sandy and Su Susan are married. Jonathan is still looking for love. He moves in with a sexy model actress named Bobby, played by Anne Margaret who turns out to be someone different <laughs> than expected, not exactly the relationship that either one expected. As the film continues, these relationships become messier and messier. We're left to wonder if either Sandy or Jonathan will ever be able to emotionally connect with another woman. It's kind of like the basic synopsis, and I didn't want to give away the very, very end segment, but there's some stuff to talk about there too. <laughs> Anything else you want to add to that? Anything I messed up? <laughs> oh, no, um, not at all. That That is cursorily what it's about. Yeah. Um, this is a good chapter in uh, Mike Harris's biography on Mike Nichols, Mike Nichols, A Life. Um, and Jules Pfeiffer said it, he said it is a, it is a book, it, not a play, not a book. It is a movie <laughs> about the fact that heterosexual men don't like women. That, that that and he wanted to feel sort of like he he was a he was a cartoonist he did work for the village voice he did these satirical comic strips and this was sort of a way to expand that he had also written a couple plays mike nichols had directed one of his one acts and actually ended up putting one of the same one act in a later play that wasn't quite working um this was jules pfeiffer's idea about the story yes and he talked about that in the mark harris book in the Mark Harris book, and I also just like read some stuff on IMDb and then okay. watched a Mike Nichols documentary yesterday. But yeah, that um that that quote is from the uh the Mike Harris the Mark Harris book, not Mike Harris. So yeah. My apologies. <laughs> it's yeah, it's Mark Harris, Mike Nichols. <laughs> yeah, Mark Mark Harris. He he is one of my absolute favorite writers on film. Uh, his his first book, Pictures at a Revolution, might be my favorite film book. Like I've read that three times. It's so rich. It's so fascinating. Uh, we, you know, we don't get a whole lot of books from Mark Harris, and we finally got a new one early in 2021 on the life of Mike Nichols. Goes into everything over what 600 pages, and yep. obviously there's a chapter on Colonel Knowledge, and just to kind of like see the progression of Mike Nichols' career, both in theater and in film. The book captures both, and it's fascinating. <laughs> It's a very good book. I actually read all three of Mark Harris's books in the last year and a half. Okay. I only recently finished Pictures at a Revolution. And then I um, I was already going to read Mike Nichols, but then I put it at the top of the list for this talk. And I yep. read it very, very fast, way faster than I probably should have. So I should, I'm glad I went back to reread <laughs> that chapter because it is, 
it's in the middle of a transitionary period. So, mm-hmm. you know, Mike Nichols goes to University of Chicago. Uh, he meets up with with Elaine May and all of yep. his friends. Then he goes to Second City for a while. Mm-hmm. And he, he studies Meisner and he works with Stella Adler for a while. And then he does the the Nichols and May stuff, um, which we'll get into a little bit later, which is just sort of semi-improvised comedy. He became a millionaire by getting the right deal mm-hmm. and decided and was offered Virginia Woolf. And he, when they were told, when he was told you had to make this in color, he says, well, you know, I, I'll just go home and you can make it in color. I yeah. actually like being home. Um, my home is nice. Um yeah, he was not Marcus. He was not. He was not actively like trying to get a film off the ground, right? He was not really. He was really actively directing theater for a few years, right? Yeah. He started to get really comfortable there, and they came to him, right, with directing the film of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Because he had won be- the Tony for Best Director three years in a row, or yeah. pretty much three years in a row. So it's Barefoot in the Park, mm-hmm. and then Love, and then The Odd Couple, mm-hmm. and then he moves into. Virginia Woolf, and then he gets to make The Graduate, which it, like right is, after. A, <laughs> it's a hugely chaotic um, production that he's not sure what he's doing. Then he makes Catch-22, which goes way over budget, yeah. and he realizes he's in way over his head. I actually <laughs> watched it for the first time yesterday morning. I think it's a great movie. I was shocked by how good it was. Really? People talk about, and you and I kind of agree on this, that people talk about MASH like it's this incredibly groundbreaking thing. It it doesn't quite hold up anymore. Yeah, no, I liked it. I like MASH. Fine. It's not, yeah, it's not a groundbreaking film, I would say. <laughs> Whereas Catch-22, which people at the time thought it was a mess because they were really out to get him, in his opinion, Yeah. Um, after winning Best Director and making yep. Inflation Adjusted, one of the highest grossing films of all time with The Graduate. Mm-hmm. And after that goes over budget, he decides to just, I'm going to make carnal knowledge with the same producer as the graduate who lets him do anything he wants. It's only Mm -hmm. a $4 million budget. They go to Vancouver. They shoot it really fast. Um, Mike Nichols tells everybody in the cast, do not smoke weed during this. (laughs) it'll, it'll, it'll It'll cut down your timing. And Jack Nicholson, who claimed he had been high every day for 18 years, said, oh, he's right. Candace Bergen says it's the most sensuous set she's ever been on because they were just so relaxed. They did French hours. They shot from like 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Oh, really? Hung out in the hot tubs and had great food for a while. Um, and everybody's <laughs> banging each other. So, yeah, so it's Vancouver as New York. This is all set up to, oddly, this is him making a relaxing movie. The movie is not relaxed no. in the slightest. <laughs> Yeah, and this is his last kind of critically acclaimed film for a while, right? So after Carnal Knowledge, he directs The Day of the Dolphin, which I remember <laughs> was one of my favorite chapters in the Harris book. It was really interesting oh, about the failure of that movie. And then he does The Fortune again with Jack Nicholson and with Warren Beatty, which you think those three would make something spectacular, but I have not seen The Fortune. Uh, can you comment on The Fortune? What's that one about? It, um... From 75. I would say it is my least favorite of his movies. Really? Only, okay. I'm looking. I'm looking at his stuff now. There's only three. Um, hold on. Let me put these in in the proper order of my ranking. Okay. That's yeah. He I doesn't have. About. He doesn't. Mar- yeah. Mike Nichols does not have a ton of movies. It's not. He's not like yeah. a movie every year kind of director. Well, he, he has 21 movies. There's 21. Only, there's only three and a half. I really don't like the fortune should work. It is a mess. So the thing about comedy, especially like in the seventies and eighties, when something isn't working, you can tell because everybody is screaming their lines. This is also this is also a theater problem. So yeah. everything that he thinks is kind of funny, it just lays there. And it's about two con artists in the 20s. So it's Warren Beatty and Jack Nicholson. Oh, it's in the 20s. Okay. Yeah, it's torturing Stockard Channing, who is an heiress. And they're trying mm. to get her to either kill herself or get killed. Mm-hmm. Um, but Mike Nichols, as much as I, I, I love his work, there is sort of a male gaze to his work and mm. he doesn't always quite get women yeah. unless it's starring Meryl Streep, who's the person <laughs> who challenges him. Yeah, who really got him back on... It's a huge mess, yeah. huge mess. Meryl Streep finally gets him back on track a little with his film career when he comes back yes. with Silkwood in 83, but we will talk a little bit more about... I'm so Nichols sorry. At the end. No, 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 that's <laughs> Like, No, I wanted to kind of touch on his film work in the 70s when we look at 
carnal knowledge because as I said, this is kind of his last acclaimed film for a while. Uh, so let's see, some other, some other research I did. Uh, Mike Nichols spent six months looking for the right actress to play Bobby, settling on of all actresses Anne Margaret, which I, I'm assuming in like 1970 would not have been the obvious choice for that role no. of Bobby. Because right. she um, was no longer getting the sex pot roles. Yep. She's 29 at this point, and she's making European action and heist films. <laughs> okay. So, so he, he goes to Jane Fonda first, and Jane Fonda turns it down and says, they want me to play a character with a 40-inch chest? I, I'm weird? Okay, fine. Wow. I'm going to go make Clute. She goes and makes Clute, gets the Oscar. Yeah. And Margaret gets nominated in Supporting Actress. Yeah. Um, we did, yeah. We just talked. We just talked about Clute on the podcast uh, two weeks ago. That episode will have dropped by now. And Jane Fonda is so extraordinary in that. I cannot picture her in Carnal Null. <laughs> no, and 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 so it was also. He also looked at a uh, Karen Black. Yep. Um, from Five Easy um, Pieces. Five Easy Pieces. He actually Jack Nicholson brought her because Mike Nichols looked at um, Jack Nicholson in Easy Rider and said. Okay, Jules Pfeiffer, I know these characters are Jewish men. This guy is not a Jewish man, but look at his performance in here. Jules Pfeiffer says, are you sure this looks like a crazy person? He's like, no, he will be the best actor since Brando. <laughs> Trust me on this. So so, so Mike Nichols was not on board with Nicholson from the beginning on Cardinal no, Knowledge. He was Pfeiffer. Kind of, Pfeiffer, oh, Pfeiffer was not on board. So, so Nichols wanted Nicholson but yes. Pfeiffer was like are you crazy <laughs> yes well and they, decided about... that's, they decided that since since it's written by a Jewish man and directed by a Jewish man okay. they could it doesn't have to be so enclosed in their own understanding of, of of humanity and they need this guy from Jersey with the the sort of the sort of drawl to to open it up so he brought over Karen Black from Easy Rider okay Mike Nichols thought she just wasn't right for the role and certainly not physically built right because uh, Mike Nichols, like I said, does have a female problem. He recast Kate Blanchett in Closer because she was pregnant. And that was a shock to right. her. Mm -hmm. um, with Julia Roberts, right? With Julia Roberts. Mm -hmm. who, and it's actually, I think, the best Julia's ever been. Oh, she's great in, in Closer. It's been a while since and I've he seen also, it. He also offers it to Raquel Welch, or he th considers her. He also considers Ellen Burstyn, who almost does it, and then turns it down. And then when she sees the movie, said, Ang and Margaret... God, it's so much better than I ever could. Thank yeah. God they cast her. So Anne Margaret's agents reached out to Mike Nichols, said, okay. please let her do this. She's an actress. Believe in her. And it works. It does work, which we Holy will talk crap, about. Yeah, it she, works. I, you know, I, I've seen some of her later films, like Grumpy Old Men and some of those from the <laughs> 90s. And then in the 60s, I think the only thing I've seen Anne Margaret in is like an Elvis movie I watched in Turner Classic Movies. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas. Viva which, Las Vegas. Which is Elvis's best movie. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of fun. But when I see her in her first scene in Carnal Knowledge, I'm thinking Viva Las Vegas. And I'm like, okay, interesting. I, I had looked it up that she had been nominated for an Oscar. And I'm like, okay, what's, where's this going? Yeah. And then as we'll talk about the big fight she, scene, it's like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, she, she is wonderful in Bye Bye Birdie, but I can see why okay. people don't take her seriously. And then after this, she makes Tommy and she gets an Oscar nomination out of that. And she is also great in Tommy. Um, do a not film I have not seen? I need to see Tommy. I'm excited. It's cr watch watch all of Ken Russell's musicals. He's Ken out Russell. of his mind. Love him, love him, love him. Is he on drugs? Of course. Um, is, it, is he the director of The Devils, which came out in 71? Yeah. Okay. I'm like considering doing an episode on the devils. So I think I might. Oh, might you better. Um, although, <laughs> although the director's cut just, just left shutter recently. Oh, there was Even a, there's there like a director's a cut. Okay. Oh, there, the, 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 um, that is a heavily <laughs> cut feature. Okay. So I'll, you'll like, if I do that episode, Marcus, I should do it on the director's cut, like watch that version. Yes, and and in addition to the director's cut, there's an additional sequence that was that's not even in the director's cut because it's like X-rated. And oh, okay, <laughs> I I have that somewhere. Oh, you do? Yes. You have the only copy of the X size. No, 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 no. It, it's online. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm gonna take a look at that. Uh, do you know how Candace Bergen or Art Gun Art Gun Garfunkel came to be in the movie? I could not Art find Art anything Art about Funkers. that. Um, so Garfunkel of Simon and Garfunkel did the music for The Graduate. So I'm assuming like that relationship is how he got cast in Carnal Knowledge. But I looked up his IMDb, he doesn't really have a lot of acting credits. So I'm just curious 
like how that came to be if you know well, anything about them. first he does the he co-does the music for the graduate yep um he he is in catch 22 yeah brief role right in catch 22 uh, well everybody in catch 22 everybody is a brief role because, yeah, which, yeah, it's like holy crap is that is that is that Grodin? Holy crap! Is that Bob Balaban? Holy crap! Is that Richard Benjamin? <laughs> Anthony Perkins. Everybody. Anthony Perkins. Everybody's in it. No, it's it's actually a fairly sizable role, all things considered, and he does a really good job. And Nichols looks at it, that performance and says he's actually perfect for Sandy because okay. he has this very sweet nature quality of him, but inside is something a little uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. I see that in him because Mike Nichols was a guy who really elevated works especially comedies by finding the reality in them um mm-hmm. every every piece of direction he did was trying to find something that he could relate to in ergo the audience could too that's why we think of these neil simon plays as silly mm-hmm. but his versions of these neil simon plays are actually like these weird little dramedies mm-hmm. that are and done the right way neil simon's work can be very gutting and personal done the wrong way it's broad and silly and a bunch of one-liners which is how <laughs> most people think of him now which is totally fine because it's a very male-centered point of view so yeah. that's how we got to art garfunkel and thought he was perfect because art garfunkel and jack nicholson are foils to each other mm-hmm. in a very good way mm-hmm. Candace Bergen, he had met and considered casting in The Graduate. So they have been friends. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And And she was really, she's really prolific around this time. She has a bunch of credits, I want to say in 1970. She's like got four of them. So she's very much in demand and is a welcome presence in this movie as well. It's kind of fun to see her. I mean, I, you know, she's been in projects just recently. She just did a film with Meryl Streep, Let Them All Talk by Steven Soderbergh, which I watched a few months ago, which I enjoyed. And to see her 50 years ago in this movie was kind of cool. Yeah. All right. So let's see what else. The scene in which Sandy takes out a condom while in bed with Susan was the first time a condom had ever been shown in a film. Yep. <laughs> that kind of struck me as it like 1971, like before that year, there had never been a condom in a movie. That's crazy. So when Mike Nichols went to Jules Pfeiffer and said, can we make this a movie? Jules said, are you sure we can't get away with any of this language in a movie? He's like, I made the graduate. I made, so so in Virginia yeah. Wolf, um, they went back and forth with the censors a lot. Mm-hmm. And then finally the, um, the, 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 the motion picture, the, the board, the Hayes Code said, okay, this is fine because it's artistically sound. But that was one of the many movies that cracked open the Hayes Code, which mm-hmm. officially killed it in 1968 after being around for 34 years. Mm-hmm. Then he makes The Graduate and gets away with showing breasts for a split second. Very split second. <laughs> it, it, it's when Dustin Hoffman first sees yeah. Um, Mrs. Robinson naked and mm-hmm. he says and he goes to Pfeiffer and says I made the graduate we can do whatever we want implying that it's a new world but also Mike Nichols is sort of an arrogant person and, he, and and that's what actually makes this movie so good because in my opinion after reading the biography he sees a lot of himself in this because mm-hmm. he is good with female actresses but we other than his marriage to Diane Sawyer which does not get a lot of 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 room in the book yeah um, because i'm sure they're like whatever i'm sure diane sawyer is a private person he has two or three marriages that fall apart immediately because he would rather work than be with his kids and be with his wife Mm -hmm. so he like mike nichols kind of looks at this film and says it would be so easy to become one of these men maybe you already have Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's something so interesting about carnal knowledge is that just a few years before He's kind of being censored a little bit in those first two films. And here in 71, now he can show more. He can do more things. But I don't feel like he ever goes too explicit here. I think like the nudity in Carnal Knowledge is, has a lot of taste to it. Like yeah. he does it in, in a very cinematic way. He's never like preying on Anne Margaret's body in a way that's like, like seems outside of the realm of like what the narrative is about. Like it always feels like there's taste there. I don't know. And he gets to work for, let me get his name perfectly because it's Italian, Giuseppe Rotuno, who is Fellini and Visconti's cinematographer. So he okay. he, he brings in a little bit of that European sensibility, mm-hmm. the European sensibility that also contributed to killing the motion picture code, the production code. Okay. Because people like us 50 years ago were more interested in foreign films because they felt more real, more adult, mm-hmm. more in line with what society was. Okay. Yeah. So he, so yeah, he, he's at this point, Easy Rider has come out, Five Easy Pieces has come out, and the MPA, MPAA is about to start. So they can do mostly whatever they want to a point because you say, like, you know, it's tasteful nudity for the most part. It's not that explicit. 
but the guy in Albany, Georgia, who showed the film at this theater was arrested and they shut down the movie and it went all the way to the Supreme, the Supreme Court, Court yeah. who said, no, this is artistic. There's nothing pornographic about this. And then he opens it three months later and makes a crap load of money. The fact that people were pressing this movie because of its explicit content, like there's a joke in All in the Family episode about it <laughs> because <laughs> Ethel thought she was seeing cardinal knowledge cardinal it would be about, it would be about religion <laughs> and um and archie's like you know that that's that filthy film so this was the filthy film like from our perspective it's not it's, it doesn't seem at all but in 1971 this exploded people's brains and the and the exploitation <laughs> producer who produced um the graduate also produced this so after it ran for three months in the best single screen theater in manhattan he moved it to the second half of a double bill at a softcore porn theater where it made a crap load more money this movie played at this a softcore porn theater. <laughs> and the back half of a double bill. <laughs> In the back half. The, the, that didn't disappoint the audiences? <laughs> no. <laughs> They're like, this isn't what I signed up for. But like when I told when I told my dad I was going to be talking to you about carnal knowledge, he's like, yeah, that's a really controversial film. I remember that. It was it, it's all people could talk about. Really? So the summer of 71, it was like a big, like not word of mouth necessarily. You have to go see this because it's a great film. It was known as like the controversial major release film of, of summer of 71. Yeah. More I mean, so than like Clute. Clute, which also, I mean, it doesn't have very much nudity in it, but that's also about some controversial subject matter too. Right. That, that is about like the autonomy of sex workers in a way mm -hmm. that is revolutionary today. It's still ahead of its time in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. So that's interesting. So yeah, you touched on pretty much all my other research. I mean, we mentioned that it got one Academy Award nomination for Anne Margaret. She had won the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress. Nicholson and Art Gar Garfunkel also nominated at the Golden Globes. Pfeiffer was nominated for Best Comedy, written directly for the screen at the Writers Guild Awards. And the film did pretty well critically. If you go on Wikipedia, some interesting, like some critics really loved it. Some critics, not so much. Uh, Roger Ebert gave it four stars, called it clearly Mike Nichols' best film. That's a quote from his review from 71. And right now it's 87% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I guess there's a couple critics out there who just don't <laughs> think right. it's so great. But that's all the research I have. Do you have anything else to add before we just talk about what we thought of the movie? And I thought we could kind of take it by segments, kind of go through kind of the movie a little bit in terms of how it goes chron chronologically. Um, anything else research-wise? I think that's about it. Yeah. So, Marcus, what are your thoughts on Carnal Knowledge? You've seen all of Mike Nichols' films. Where does this one rank in his list of 21 movies? <laughs> For me, it is right near the top. Okay, I, like in the I, top five. Yes, and 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 we'll talk later about um, which of his I like most. But okay. I, like, I like domestic dramas that are about not cruelty, but showing cruelty mm. and um, being very raw and open and um, pushing envelopes. Mm -hmm. I, I saw this for the first time like 10 years ago, okay. and then I watched it twice in the last couple of weeks. I watched it yesterday, then a week and a half ago. Um, Sweet. It, I, I, um, he, even though it is not a play, it still feels like a play. I love the yeah. very long takes. I love the, the, very, the very quick jumps between timelines that he will later use in Closer. Mm -hmm. And it would be shocking to me if Patrick Marber, who wrote Closer, was not influenced by carnal knowledge. Uh, I, if he said he wasn't, I would say you're a liar. <laughs> if he had said, oh, it, I've never heard of that one. You'd it, be it is, it is okay. smart. It is, it, is, it is scathing. It is cruel. And there are only six speaking roles, which I love. Mm -hmm. And they're all perfectly cast and mm -hmm. perfectly acted. Um, this movie is not for everybody. I understand that. It focuses very much on the men and that could be exhausting even at like 97 minutes. But the first time I saw this, <laughs> it just blew me away because I realized how much it influenced in theater and film later, the movies I like that are not quite for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of firing on all cylinders. And Mike Nichols has made a lot of great movies. I think he's a great filmmaker. Um, sometimes, especially like in the 90s, he phones it in. And he does not <laughs> phone this one in. He he clear, like he read the script and he knew exactly how it looked. He never had to think about it. Whereas on Virginia Woolf, he was literally asking like the DP, okay, what do we do now? Where do I put the camera? How do I dress up for this role? Yeah, so when he started filming Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, he was really out of his element, right? He couldn't yeah. quite figure out, like, okay, wait, how do I use the camera here to 
get the actors inside the house <laughs> coming through the door. And by carnal knowledge, which is five years later, something I noticed while watching this, I'm like, okay, he's very confident as a filmmaker by this point. Yes. You know, it's not a grand scale movie like Catch-22. It's very small, just a few characters. But the way he uses the camera in the movie is really interesting. It never, he never does any shots that take you out of the movie by any means, but he, he does do some kind of cool tricks like the very first two shots of the movie, very, very long takes. He's interested in the characters and he doesn't want to, you know, use any sort of like style to take anything away from them. Right. And he intentionally has the art director design very spare sets. Um, yeah. They're all very white. There's really no art on the walls. The only time we see art on the wall is right at the breakup scene or the, the big fight scene when we see an image of her as a model. It's the only thing mm. on the wall. Mm -hmm. And then we only really get to any kind of proper design and that's the final scene in the film which we'll talk about later okay which is designed intentionally to to mock him as a man a silly silly ridiculous man something else i loved about it was just i never knew exactly where it was going i thought when the movie began i thought okay the whole movie is about jack nicholson and Ar garfunkel kind of romancing candace bergen and that was the movie and then Anne margaret will come in at some point and maybe take Nicholson away or something. like the way the film is structured was not what I was expecting at all. And kind of, it, it left me with a lot of joy, like never really knowing exactly where it was going as opposed to some other films I've looked at for the podcast the last few months where in the first 10 minutes, you know exactly what the rest of the movie's going to be. This right. was not that at all. Right. I mean, it it's almost like veering on like comedy with like, you know, it's like a plot you would see in like a teen comedy in the 90s, right? Like yeah. two guys are going to date the same girl and one of the guys doesn't know. And, oh, it's going to, they're, they're, you know, they're going to blow up at each other at some point. And isn't that hilarious? But it never felt that way to me. It always felt real. And you could tell that, you know, Candace Bergen's character of Susan, she's trying to figure herself out. And, you know, what kind of a guy do I want to be with? And uh, I just, I, the first segment, which is what, 30, 35 minutes long? I just, yes, I just, just loved that. Thing. Yeah, I loved all of that. And even though it was a little bit hard to buy, like Nicholson as a college student, <laughs> I don't know about whatever. you, but that stuff is just like, it's like, whatever. I mean, you just yeah. have to go with it. Better that than having a different actor play him or have them do something to his hair that's ridiculous. I'd rather it just be like, we'll just go with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh... I love the first five minutes because the, the credits are just red letters over black and it's uh, Sandy and Jonathan talking about the exact woman um, um, they want to date because they're, yeah. they're basically children. They're, they're, they're just in college. They're over at Amherst. She's at um, Candace Perkins at Smith, which is only like 20 minute drive away. Mm -hmm. And, but they're, they're talking about, and I can't quote a lot of this movie because this is not an explicit podcast. That's right. And this is a very explicit <laughs> movie, it ha which has the first instance of the C word in an American film. Mm -hmm. In the scene with Anne Margaret, right? In the. Yeah, he says it twice to her. Yeah. I mean, he's, does he say it twice? Because there's one time he, sa he says it that it was so fast. I almost was like, wait, did he just say that? Right. Oh my yeah. God. Oh, no. He says it in the fight, <laughs> and then he says it during Ball Busters on Parade near the end. Okay. There is um, one. There is one quote I wrote down from the first segment that I can quote. He said, uh, "She says, uh, Susan says to Jonathan, I will always be your friend.'" And he says, "Jesus, Susan, I hope not." <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good line. I wrote that down. Yeah, in in the first act, um, he loves me. Well, that's no reason to go to bed with him. Ooh. <laughs> so, but so so during that opening conversation over black, they're like, "I want a girl with big word for breasts." Breasts. Yep. But she also has to be a virgin. I'm like, oh my god, we're we're gonna sit with these idiotic men for this yeah. whole time, um, and then it then and then that conversation is over because they're talking to each other at this college mixer, and then the black kind of comes up a little bit, and Candace Bergen enters the college mixer, but she's coming from her car and everything behind her is pitch black, and she's walking into this white room. We are being mm -hmm. introduced into this movie, and in like by showing by showing her first and not them yeah. it's putting us in her position that we are allowed to mock these men even though we're going to spend 97 cringe inducing minutes with that <laughs> it tells you immediately to not trust these men if their opening conversation didn't tip that off yeah that was something i thought about a lot while watching this movie i'm like gosh can't we get a little bit more from like the women's side of things it's very it's very much told from the men 
and Nicholson especially. Like Art Garfunkel becomes a very supporting character in segments two and three. It really, after the first 35 minutes, becomes kind of Nicholson's movie. Right, and, and Candace Bergen goes away. After and the Candace first Bergen is gone. I couldn't believe that. She is so <laughs> striking. I love her so much in this movie that I, maybe my biggest criticism, I said, why can't we get a scene in segment two with Sandy and Susan? Like, why does it have to be the Nicholson show in the, se in the second segment? For I mean, it's 97 minutes. We could add yeah. 10 more minutes. <laughs> You know, yeah, it, I, I see why he why they do it, because th they're being very forward with their intentions. Um, yeah. the, o the only music is diegetic, except for yep. the act transitions, which is circus music, because these men are clowns. <laughs> I didn't put that together. That's a great point. And it also sounds a little bit like baseball, especially during the end credits. It sounds like something like it's, it's an organ you hear at a baseball game, like it's all mm -hmm. a sport. Um, I understand why they would get rid of Candace Bergen, because we've learned everything that the men know about her at that mm -hmm. point everything after is filtered through art garfunkel True. saying you know like we actually have a great sex life we don't make it a routine but i'm a little bored can you know your your woman she has the figure my woman has the brains why aren't we happy mm -hmm. well because we learn in act two um not to jump ahead <laughs> but jack nicholson works in taxes he only sees people as numbers which yep. goes along really well with his character and sandy our garfunkel <laughs> is a doctor he sees them as things to fix nothing more <laughs> yep i you know i get that i just we we have so much material with nicholson i just wondered like one brief like fight scene or something between yeah. sandy and susan at their house we could have stayed with Sandy. We could have like, you know, gone from that scene to maybe a scene with Nicholson or something. I just, I just thought there was an opportunity missed there because she's such a kind of a rich character in the first act. And yeah, you know, it would have been nice because it's, it, how, how many years forward is it when we go to segment two? Is it like 10 years um, or, or less he, than that? When they're, when they're driving through New York, um, Nicholson and Anne Margaret, it's like 1961, if you can tell from the movies and shows that are on Broadway. And okay. they mention uh, Kennedy. So they get their timelines a little skewered. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's 10, about 10, 10, 13 years. Yeah, it's about 10 years later mm -hmm. when, we, when we leave them in Act 1 and see them ogling women at the ice rink mm -hmm. in Act 2. I under, like, um, like, consider that they have titles. So Act 1 is Susan. Act 2 is called Bobby. Bobby, and Act Three is whatever Rita Moreno sex. Rita Moreno. Um, so, yeah. so the thing is, like, we already see Candace. We already see everything that the character can do. We see her okay. controlling their sex mm -hmm. lives and yeah. not being part of their game. She is always in control, and they don't know that because they think they're in mm -hmm. control. Because yeah. that's all they want. They want the chase. But then we see um, Jack Nicholson loses virginity to her on a pile of hay, and she looks very uncomfortable that yeah that is an awkward scene i mean i like that nichols shoots that in one shot wasn't it just yeah. the whole thing was one take like he's just yep. on top of her and this is you know 71 like he finishes and kind of rolls over and she's just kind of like looking up and and it's a very raw moment in the movie that you i mean i'm assuming most audiences have not really seen in a film mm -hmm. on the big screen before that summer of 71 and then um, we see her sort of get wise to what's going on and get a little less interested. We do see her, yeah. like, um, when they're at a bar, and what's really fun about this movie is it shows people listening. It mm -hmm. is, so you say, like, yes, it's very much all the men talking, but we keep on seeing the women listening to them, just so he makes sure that we know what he knows, that these, that these ridiculous men are just, they, they're children, they have no idea what to do with these women. Mm -hmm. So when we see Candace Bergen, laughing at all their jokes it's all very performative yeah and Nicholson i thought that i thought that was one of the most believable shots of a person laughing in a movie right well, Bergen's laugh and that's and they get into this in the mark harris book that he kept on having feeding like puns and word games to nicholson and garfunkel to make her break and the second she broke that's when he started shooting oh okay very cool yeah i forgot i forgot about that part so, that's yeah. it's so fantastic Nichols likes to, he doesn't play games with people, but he knows how to get into their, their sense memory. He says, you know, this, he learns a lot about a person and yeah. says, this is a lot like, so Candace is a friend of his. He knows what'll make her crack. And he follows that. Um, and he also likes people to be very emotionally intimate with each other. Um, before a show opens on Broadway, he will have them 
sit down in cots in the back of the theater in the dark, sitting next, lying down next to each other, like inches from each other, and have them speed through their lines. So like listening to people- well, they'll just go really people. fast. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, the Italiano style is, 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 what, it's, is what it's called. Um, but like, if you're actually breathing with somebody and feeling their rhythms, that is actually an old theater trick that people mm -hmm. use nonstop now. So he does that a lot here too. So while Candice Bergen would show up in act two, we already know everything we need to know about her. And yeah. it, would, it would honestly lower my respect for her character if we saw her in these crushing positions. That's true. Yeah, I mean, there is something about to be the said about there is something to be said about just kind of seeing her at this part of her life, and you know, the second segment is a little bit. It's about different people, different subjects. So yeah, I mean, I can see both sides of it. So that yeah, that does make sense. I but totally get it. Like yeah, go ahead. I totally get it. Like um, the, when I, the second time I watched this was with my wife who had the exact same complaint because right. you know she she loves these she loves movies she loves you know nasty movies this movie clearly <laughs> has um, influenced Neil Butte and she really likes his oh, work yeah. as well um, and we'll get into that a little bit later mm -hmm. but she has the same complaint is like this is all men she would prefer if we have a choice between movies about or directed by women or movies about or directed by men, she will always choose the women because it is still a minority, especially in American film. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One other scene I wanted to mention, the scene with the condom, for me, that was the most uncomfortable. One of the most uncomfortable scenes in the movie is him pressuring her to have sex with him was very, especially in 2021, that scene, I don't know about you, that just, I was like, okay. This, oh, it's rough. He, he's like, no, let's do it. She's like, no, I'm not feeling it. I'm okay. And he's like, no, no, let's, I, you know, I have protection. Let me, let's do this. And that and she says, scene, how long has it been there? He's like, not, not that long. Yeah. How long, what did she say? Like, was it been there for 10 years? Right. <laughs> it's been there. He's like, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So that the pressuring her and that's right after she's had sex with Nicholson's character, right? Like, isn't that just like the next scene or it's like very close? And yet? it's in it his is. dorm room. Yeah. Cause the last time we saw the dorm room was he and Nicholson in their respective beds smoking as if they had sex because the thing is a lot of this movie and their problems could be solved if they just kissed each other i mean <laughs> like Eber talks about this he says this is a movie about people pushing down their homosexual tendencies mm -hmm. and taking it out on women mm -hmm. yeah i did wonder i was like why can't jonathan just go after any other woman it's like right. if he doesn't she, want he to. has to be in the like realm of his best friend and that there was a homoerotic element to that I was kind of thinking about while watching the first 35 minutes of this movie. Oh, it's there. It's there. You know, absolutely. Anything else in the first segment with Bergen? I, as I said, I thought she was great in this. I have not seen a lot of Bergen's early work on film, and I just thought she was luminous in this. Just a great, great uh, piece of casting for this movie. As you say, all six members of the actors here are just like on fire. <laughs> They're just all fantastic, including Garfunkel, which... I mean, I guess he's briefly in Catch-22, but other than that, I will, you know, have not seen him, you know, act on film. And I thought he was really strong in this too. No, I'm, I'm good on, I'm good on the, 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 uh, the Susan segment. Okay. <laughs> and then I would say, I don't know about you, I thought Garfunkel aged better throughout the movie than Nicholson does. <laughs> like by the oh, yes. end segment, like, I'm like, okay, I can buy that. Uh, whereas Nicholson kind of looks the same he has like less hair in the end segment like he's got like a bald spot that's like the yeah. one difference i could see <laughs> I, I would say because act two is so much about jonathan yeah we are watching him grow through his character through emotions through what he mm -hmm. says whereas we're only checking in on sandy after part one yeah, so yeah it exactly. has to be it has to be clearer costume and styling wise <laughs> yeah so yeah, Jonathan, a little bit more reserved in the first act and come the second act, we, you know, it's so funny watching these early Nicholson films. Like when I think of seventies Nicholson, I think of like crazy manic guy, especially in like last detail and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, not so much in Chinatown. He's a little bit more reserved in Chinatown, but uh, you know, the first half of this movie, you know, he's pretty reserved, but then if you're looking for the Nicholson we've seen in other films, we do get to see it by the end of carnal knowledge. So what do we think of segment two, bringing in Anne Margaret in, into this movie? Well, he he is searching for a trophy wife mm -hmm. he, or just a trophy woman and he finds somebody and then realizes he cannot handle her depression and vulnerability. To him, vulnerability is 
is, is weakness, which is weakness. not true in yeah. real life. Um, and he just can't handle what a woman actually is, only the mm-hmm. idea of a woman. Nicholson's character is constantly showering throughout this movie, and he's always yeah. trying to present himself in a certain way. And we'll get to the big fight, which is the centerpiece of the movie. Mm-hmm. They, they all knew it at the time, too. But while that scene is happening, she's still in a very state of undress, as he gets madder and madder at her, he's putting on more and more clothes. He's putting on his shell, putting uh-huh. on his costume, his disguise, because he is done with everything here. Mm-hmm. Part two is, you know, if you are not on board with watching people be horrible the way I kind of like, mm-hmm. then this is when you turn off the movie. Because, you know, um, we go to them, um, Sandy and Jonathan at the ice rink, just talking about hot women, talking about women as objects, as conquest, and not as people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... And this, and they, they they redo something I love throughout the movie is that they are looking down the barrel a lot of the time during monologues. They're looking directly at the camera. Um, there is no way around it. You cannot avert your eyes at all. You mm-hmm. are they are making you complicit with these horrible thoughts because this is something and somebody we can become if we're not careful. That's a good point. That yeah, you notice that you do not see that in movies very much when a when a character is talking to another character and they're looking directly at us through the camera. <laughs> you know, it's a trick that's been used a little bit. Like I think of like Misery, and there's some some films that do it in a way like Sounds of the Lamb. Sometimes like hor- like like more suspense films can do it in a way that's really creepy. But just in like a in a film like this, it's not something you would normally see. So that was kind of an ambitious choice yeah. by Nichols to do that. I um I love when he when we first see him with Anne Margaret, they are the idea is that they're in the spinning restaurant, probably on top of the Marriott Marquis in Times Square, but it's clearly a set that they are stationary um at their table, everything is spinning around them because it's it, it's this yeah. carnival whirlwind. He is in love with the idea of it. They bring this back with the wallpaper at the end with Rita Moreno that mm-hmm. he only feels this when he's elated. And then it cuts to them in the in the taxi cab as you see like West Side Story on the marquee behind mm-hmm. them. And and maybe this is just me, but every time they are in the darkness, because it keeps on putting them into pitch black darkness in the mm-hmm. cab, they are they are vulnerable and open to each other and honest. And then when they go into the light again, they play characters again. Interesting perspective. Yeah. I mean, there is something kind of dreamlike about that shot when the camera's just slowly kind of moving around their table. Is that yeah. the scene where she he's trying to guess her age? Right at the dinner, and, and he, he guesses he for like up, three up, 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 freaking up. minutes. It, it takes like two, two and a half minutes. I mean, it's like it's so silly. Twenty three, no. And she goes, "You skipped twenty three. Oh no, yeah, that's right. You skipped. You skipped twenty. <laughs> you skipped twenty three. Well, are you twenty three? No, no. <laughs> because she's just enamored that I guess somebody wants to know more about her than just her body, which is not uh, true. We find out. Yeah. Um, because he throughout the act starts to remove everything. Um, she's like, you know, maybe I don't go to work. He's like, why do you want to go to work? She's like, I don't, I hate it. He's like, I make plenty of money. That's fine. Quit yeah. your job. And then the next scene, the big fight is that she has no job. Get out of the house. Get maybe out. 18 hours a day. And she, she says it might it, soon. It might get to 24 hours. That's what she oh my says. God. 24 then, hours a day. And then, and then she tries to make it 24 hours. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, very, the reveal at the end of this segment. Yeah. So Anne Margaret is just such an un- unusual choice for this role. I don't think it was, as I said before, not your go-to casting choice, especially thinking about Nichols going to, you know, someone like Jane Fonda, which is just like so different from somebody like Anne Margaret and that he was looking for six months. This is ultimately the person he goes with. And it's one of those just striking like performances from an actress that probably nobody expected she had that in her. And that fight scene towards the end of this, I mean, I put my notebook down. I was like, I am not taking my eyes off this. I mean, how long is that scene? Five, six minutes, um, more than that? So um, it is seven minutes. Seven minutes. Before Sandy and Cindy knock. Okay. And, that, and then it's another nine minutes of her, yeah. of her in the background and we don't yeah. know what she's doing. But right up until, so in act two, while in Margaret, so we're showing her, she still has control, although mm-hmm. Nicholson has more control now. So they're more evenly matched. So we think she's going to be like Susan, like Candace Bergen, and be yeah. controlled these idiotic men. But then she starts to lose it because he is putting mm-hmm. these ideas on her, these images, these visions of women onto her that he wants to be the breadwinner. Mm-hmm. And it takes her down. And he thinks she's not strong enough. Meanwhile, 
our Garfunkel, in the meantime, has left Candace Bergen and mm-hmm. is dating Cindy, who we first see at the tennis match, which is the most symbolic thing they could possibly do. So thank God they don't show it. They show the women watching it and watching yeah. these men fight over symbolically women mm-hmm. when they're like, we do not need to be fought over. We are autonomous human beings. And especially Cindy, as we find out later. Yeah. She's like, Cindy, she, Cindy played by Cynthia O'Neill, an actress I don't know very much about. I don't know if she was a theater actress or, but she has just a little bit of screen time in this movie. Yeah. Striking, like just really just, you know, physically and her performance is so like on point, like kind of her showing control over Jonathan at a certain point in the movie later on. And right. uh, so, I mean, all six of the members of this cast, like there's no like wasted line of dialogue or performance in this movie. No. And the thing is, it's very heightened left of center dialogue. And a lot of these are new actors. So Nichols really worked very closely with them and gave them three weeks of rehearsal, which is a lot for a movie. For a movie. Not so much. For the, 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 that's a theater rehearsal process. Mm-hmm. Whereas Catch-22, he didn't really rehearse because the script by Buck Henry had to condense so much of a classically acknowledged mm-hmm. book. That, yeah. And like, yeah. Um, and Anne Margaret is shown before the fight scene. She's shown in a very flattering light. Those early oh, yeah. scenes with her, she looks oh, absolutely God. gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, that scene when she comes in for the first time to his place, right? And you know, she's kind of just standing there, and he's like, he's kind of like nervously kind of walking around. I mean, I like this move. The camera loves Anne Margaret in this movie, and but what's interesting is that the early images of her are what we recognize from films she had done in the, like in the '60s, like. Viva Las Vegas is kind of that image of her, but then we kind of strip that all away for that fight scene where we get to really see a different side of her, which makes it so interesting. Well, and then in between that, so yeah. like, you know, he takes her home, he puts his head in her bosom like a child. She's like, mm-hmm. oh good, I'm in control, you know, saying like, <laughs> this is my son. And then later, like, you know, she's she's laying naked face down on the bed, he's in the shower and he calls her over. Um, so it's showing, it, the, the one time we see them like truly in love is when they are both literally naked, naked. And stripped of everything, <laughs> stripped of all their disguises. And then, you know, she goes into the shower with him and, and they're play acting. And then the next scene, we see them screwing, basically. They're not making love. And he mm. he flips over just like with Candace Bergen earlier. And then she sits her back against the wall, kind of smirking at him while he's saying, I refuse to be married to you. And she's like, okay, fine. So she's letting down her guard that, okay, I love this man but something's off. Mm-hmm. And then it cuts to him the next scene, smoking a cigar after she calls him a prick. Sorry for the, the swearing on this, <laughs> um, which is a lovely cut because there's that symbolism again. And he's like, you know what? Maybe I will shack up with this woman. Mm-hmm. And it's when he does that, that everything starts to crumble. And mm-hmm. we get to the scene, mm-hmm. the scene that Jules Pfeiffer thought was almost too tough to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and Mike Nichols realized later on was very close to fights he had had with Pat Scott on um, his second or third wife. Okay. And then um, so we, we can just get into the scene if you're ready. Yeah, let's get into the fight. So, okay. so I believe so, from my research, it took a week to shoot. Exactly. And by the end of the shoot, both Nicholson and, and Margaret had lost their voices. <laughs> yes, um, because yeah, this is a scene you have to do for a week because they are both in separate shots. They rarely sh- share a shot together, yeah. which is also symbolic, obviously Mm -hmm. Um, because they are in separate worlds. Um, Mike Nichols was actually worried about this scene and says, this is too much. I'm going to hurt these actors. We can't do it. And Jules Pfeiffer, instead of challenging him, realized, because he's an old old friend of his, he just let Mike Nichols talk it out. They went in the car together. They went to uh, um, dinner together. And Mm -hmm. Mike Nichols just kept on yammering and Jules kept on going, "Uh uh-huh, sure, that's interesting. And by the time they got to the end of dinner, Mike Nichols talked himself out of it. In a way, he never would had he been challenged. Interesting. Yeah. So, so we, as we you said, you, you say it lasts about seven minutes and it doesn't start really raw. Like it starts kind of quiet, right? And then it just keeps building and building and building. It starts with her in the bathroom with the water on. And he says, you know, he, he makes a crack about her her receipt from Lord and Taylor's. He's like, you need, mm-hmm. you guys need to, to break up or, you know, you need to ease it up on the relationship as a joke. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, she turns out the water and says, I'm sorry, I had the water on. Can you say that again? And she's vicious about it immediately because she's exhausted by this man. We do not need to see the scenes in between. We know this. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then he gets defensive about it and she gets defensive. And she says, you know, you've been sleeping with Cindy. He's like, I have not. 
He's like, well, you love Sandy. So which is it? Who am I sleeping with? Cindy or Sandy? Make up your mind. <laughs> and, yep. and at that point, she realizes she no longer has control. And they really get into it. Nicholson has to do like four different kinds of, of argument and he nails each and every one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I don't know if these, if a scene like this had been in a film, mm. an American film in this way, um, certainly in theater, because theater, while it could be censored, was not nearly as censored as film or music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I know that like you say like they both lost their voice at one point um, in Anne Margaret's um, half of the setup. Um, she wasn't quite getting there because she had been so numbed for the week of this man she you know likes in real life just mm-hmm. eviscerating her. Mike Nichols just goes over, sits on the bed, and puts his hand on her head and keeps it there. And then she breaks down and cries, and that's the, that's the sequence they shoot. Interesting. So. The part where she starts crying, that that's not over the course of seven days. That's like just one day. That's like yeah. one other part. Okay. Because yeah, because he didn't want them to like, you know, blow their load, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and so I mean, she does she play most of that scene, at least towards the end. She's on the bed, right? She's like just yeah. pushed up against the wall. She's not really moving that much. It's Nicholson who's kind of moving around the room. And doesn't he throw stuff at some point? Like he's he, throwing he, 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 he rips the sheets off the bed <laughs> okay. when he when he gets furious. This is right. Okay. This is right when he turns into a bully. Yeah. Um, because mm-hmm. he doesn't know what else to do. He he thought he had control over women. He never has. Mm-hmm. And that and she's actually done everything he's ever asked for her. She stayed home. Um he he, or he knew she couldn't cook, but now he's extremely disappointed by 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 the the, the, the food, like the TV dinners they have to make. Yeah. She, she forgot to get the beer and they argue over that for a while. Yeah. Um, Is that actually, the same scene as this one? No. That scene where she she like brings him dinner like in a tray, like on the bed, and he's like, no, Where's I'm, I'm my wrong. beer? That's the scene right before. Scene right before, right? Like yeah. they get up, they get on the bed together and they she made some dinner and he's yeah. like, where's my beer? <laughs> so it's like, it's like, oh man, this is not going in a good direction. So we see him kind of compose as an adult throughout act two. Mm-hmm. But in, in this scene, he turns into a pet, petulant child. Yeah. Because he realizes subconsciously that he, he got everything he asked for and he is still miserable and empty and mm-hmm. he's getting impotent again, which is something he had a yep. trouble with between um, Candace Bergen d- dumping him mm-hmm. and Bobby. Bobby brings the vigor back to him, mm-hmm. basically. And then he gets bored with that too, because it's a him problem, not a her problem. Mm-hmm. It's just a riveting scene, a riveting oh. piece of acting between both actors. I mean, audiences in 1971, they were, they, I mean, they might have seen a couple moments for, like this from Nicholson in Five Easy Pieces, which came out the year before. He has a few <laughs> scenes in that movie. There's a part in Five Easy Pieces that I love where he just gets in a car and just starts like, going crazy. Right. So there had there been a little bit of that before, but this is like the first like really great piece of like dramatic fighting, acting we get from Nicholson on film and it, it shows, you know, what we're going to get from him over the next uh, 40 years in, in movies. And then opposite an actress who people saw grew up from a teenager to a sex pot yep. to a B-lister. So I'm sure the people who were offended by this movie was like, how could you do this to Kim from Bye Bye Birdie? Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I'm trying to remember how the scene ends. Is it with the knock at the door? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's. I think it's still technically a full sequence. We just leave the first half of that. They hear the knock. Sandy and Cindy are there. Yeah. Um. Um. Sandy and Jonathan talk about women. Yeah. And and Jack Nicholson's like, no, I, I really like your girlfriend. He's like, well, I wish she had. She's too masculine, because of course they hate masculinity because they hate themselves. Yep. He's like, well, what about you know the body on her? And and he's like, no, no, no. And then he offers. Our Garf- our Garfunkel switch right swap and swap Garfunkel isn't sure but then he talks him into it because mm-hmm. Jonathan has always been the bad influence mm-hmm. even though Sandy's no great man it's Nicholson is the issue mm-hmm. and then he convinces him to to go over Nicholson goes over to Cindy starts dancing with her and she's like okay fine I hope you dance better than you play tennis and then while she's not looking our Garfunkel uh, goes behind her mm-hmm. and stands at the door and looks at them for a while in a way that mirrors Jack Nicholson watching watching him watching Arkham Funkel try to seduce Candace Bergen in the first scene. Yeah, that's the second, I believe the second shot of the movie, right? Is you see Candace Bergen and Garfunkel up close, they're talking, 
and you see Nicholson in the background, almost out of focus, right? He's just kind of standing there, not moving, just watching this for like a minute or more. And then you're right. We get that same kind of shot. I think there's a little bit more camera movement, right? The camera kind of, kind of pans around him with uh, Cynthia O'Neill, but then you kind of almost creepily, you see Garfunkel kind of walking in the back and then he looks at them for a while. And he ultimately goes into the room, right? Like he goes right. in to see Bobby. And is there for a little too long. So we don't know when <laughs> he calls the ambulance because we still get yeah. Jonathan and Cindy talk about this. And, sh- and she ends she ends and saying, no, we have to go to this party. You know what? If you want to come around and see me, that's one thing. But if, if Garfungal touches that tub of lard in there, tell him not to come home, and she leaves for the party, she still yep. has autonomy, and it has pissed Jack Nicholson off. He goes to the bedroom, opens the door, and sees that Garfunkel has called an ambulance because Bobby has tried to kill herself. Bobby has tried to kill herself. I mean, just talk about an, an incredible sequence on film oh my God. from the fight to the end of the second segment and it's not even done because nicholson <laughs> runs out to the door hoping to find cindy but she's long gone he comes back in and starts screaming at an unconscious bobby from the foyer saying you know you won't get me that way very smart bobby very smart and then we transition mm-hmm. to act three but the whole thing is just 15 minutes that would just tear down the house were to play yeah it's funny when i was watching this i just assumed this was based on a play knowing it was written by i saw the name jules pfeiffer he had he was a playwright he wrote he did the play for little murders which became a movie in february of 71 came out just a few months before carnal knowledge so i'm watching this i'm like and, and obviously knowing mike nichols i'm thinking oh was this based on a play did he what what, what did uh, mark harris write in this book i was trying to remember and so yeah so he pitched this as a play to nichols but nichols said i think it works better as a movie do you know Marcus, did they ever put this like into a play, like in theater? Like, did they ever take carnal knowledge to the to the stage? I don't think so, because you know they they want to live this way. I would love to see it as a play. I'm sure I'm one of many who would love to bring it back as an adaptation, Mm -hmm. but the rights are probably you know yeah out of control. But you know, Mm -hmm. I would. It's also also at this point people aren't quite interested in this type of play anymore. 15, 20 years ago, yes, absolutely Maybe. they were. Yeah. So yeah, and we'll, and we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole thing is just this incredible centerpiece. It took forever to shoot. It tells you everything you need to know about these people and everything between the relationship between mm-hmm. men and women. Um, as, as Ebert said, men who are incapable of reaching, touching, or deeply knowing women. Um, they try to find their fantasy woman in the flesh, discover when the fantasy becomes real. The real woman is all too real for them to live with and understand. The thing is, they both want to be dominated by women, only not really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well so the said. movie isn't over at this point, but the story is over, and then we get an epilogue. Yeah, okay. I, I was thinking yeah. of it more as an epilogue than it is a third segment because yeah. it's 12 minutes. It's very yes. brief, yeah. So, so what, did you, what did you make of the final 12 minutes of so the, the epilogue of this movie? Kind so of the final 12 minutes is when we see the chasm between Jonathan and Sandy because we've learned that Sandy has always been controlled by women. He has never really been in control. He has yep. always wanted to be, but he has given in and has a much better sex life and isn't impotent. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, we see him with a 17-year-old played by Carol Kane. Carol Kane with no so, dialogue, right? With no dialogue. It, 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 it's You ask me like the thing we don't like about the, you know the things we don't like is that carol kane my favorite actress of all time has no dialogue however all she needs is that one exhausted look so <laughs> so the epilogue starts is ball busters on parade a slideshow that nicholson has created of all the women who have screwed him over and made him made him who he is every reason he hates women is on display and we get little snippets of art garfunkel in his late 60s early 70s mustache yep and then the 17 year old hippie just going Ugh. like how is this your friend yeah and, it's a very and, unusual scene i mean first off the slideshow is kind of like a kind of a way to get some exposition across here's what's happened right. <laughs> but it's done in a way i can kind of go with it but boy it's all worth it for that shot we see candace bergen for a split second and that's when we cut to garfunkel kind of do like a double yeah. take and then Oof. we kind of see the characters in their 40s for the first time. That part makes it all worth it. I just, I love yeah. that little bit. bit and I, I like editing. that for a second, it looks like the movie's over because a credit has come up, but it's a little <laughs> crummy. Yeah. 
And then, yeah, you realize that Nicholson has no reason to love, to actually be in love with the woman ever again. And he's trying to throw it onto these two people, but Garfunkel isn't really interested. And then they, they give him a double take and then leave. But Nicholson mm-hmm. and Garfunkel go have, they walk through the city and Garfunkel's like, you know what? I know she's, she's a teenager, but she is way older than me. She's way more mature. Once again, he <laughs> is being controlled by a woman. The women aren't like angrily controlling him. He just wants to be subservient and, and dominated by these people and that's what makes him comfortable mm-hmm. he has unfortunately you know gotten divorced once and clearly broke up with cindy but mm-hmm. he seems happy um whereas nicholson has become fully a monster he tried to give himself to somebody to give himself to bobby and he screwed it all up but can't can't mm-hmm. take credit he, he can't take responsibility for it so all he can do now is go see a sex worker played by rita moreno and forces her to follow a script so he can get hard. Exactly. It is one of the most unusual final scenes of a movie. I love and I it. loved it. I mean, I was I saw her credit at the beginning, Rita Moreno. I'm like, oh, I wonder what who she plays in this. And we're getting to the last like six minutes. I'm like, where's did I miss Rita Moreno? Like, oh my God, I'm losing Brian, you were losing it. <laughs> and then oh, okay, she's in the last scene. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I love that shot of them walking at night. You see like the like the buildings behind them. So like a beautiful shot there's so many i mean this is not a movie that you would normally think of as like being shot in a really memorable way it's not a movie i mean it could have just been very just camera on sticks nothing of interest there's some really gorgeous cinematography in carnal knowledge that i really like and we get to the last scene and speaking of an an amazing shot the shot of her talking to him as the camera slowly goes lower i mean that must go um, does that go on for a minute and a half marcus and Uh, she's always getting lower i'm like how is this that was, well, there's more room for her to get down, like uh, at his knees. I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's the only other, like, truly symbolic, um, like, magic fantasy shot. Because the first one is a rotating restaurant. Yep. The second one is Rita Moreno. She's not moving. The wallpaper behind her is being cranked and cranked. To oh, infinity. interesting. That's yes. how they did it. Though they're yeah, cranking it, it, it's, the... a, it's a nice theater trick. And and that's the thing because because <laughs> he thinks he's in a fantasy world, but she's giving him this 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 speech that he's planned for her, but she so clearly despises him. Um she's like she's probably going to call up her sex worker friend who she shares the apartment with and mm-hmm. says, "Let me tell you about this freaking guy who makes me do this. He pays me, it's fine." I just need to make him feel better about himself, but mm-hmm. I have control over him. He does not know that because he yelled at me when I got the dialogue wrong, but in the end, I have the control. <laughs> and you can tell that set design wise because of the never ending wallpaper as she lowers herself onto him and mm-hmm. reading him for filth. And he doesn't know it. Mm-hmm. He's in hell. Yeah. No, I mean, I feel like we leave the movie in a way that it shows, like, this is what he gets for the way he's been acting the whole movie. Like, he is in his early 40s, and he is alone with nobody. <laughs> in a very wide apartment, when we get to hers, we finally hear some music that's interesting and not, like, from World War II. Mm-hmm. And she's playing, like, the sitar music, and everything's new age, new, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the first time we see any semblance of color in the movie whatsoever, mm-hmm. actress included. Yeah, right? you know very then, not, not a diverse cast it's all white actors until we get to moreno at the end yeah and then and then and then it transitions to the the ice skater at the rink twirling out of focus we get, and that's ann margaret right you know what i thought bobby? so the first time it's not bobby then, well I, and then i watch it again but they t- say she's an art she's an actress and model and they never bring up ice skating all right I think it is her but it looks like her it, it does it looks like her and it and it, and it has her chest yeah, exactly. Um, but um, it could be read either way. The point is, it's a virginal idea of a woman, all in white, but also a perfect body. So mm-hmm. likely it is Anne Margaret. And in the credits, there's no ice skater. So let's just say yes. But yeah. on benefit of the doubt, it might not be. The point is, it's the ideal image of what Jonathan wants from a woman. Mm-hmm. And then it, then it plays this silly ass circus music, and then it's over. Yeah. But in a film that's very, very much about the men more than it is the women, we get four really great performances by women in this movie. Yeah. You know, there's been things going around, I mean, for the longest time on Twitter and things like, you know, who had less than five minutes in a movie that made an impression? And I would nominate Rita Moreno and Cynthia O'Neill in Carnal Knowledge. Like, yeah. they have just a very brief little window of, of uh, screen time, and they both are just fantastic in this. Like, I, I will always think about 
the last scene of this movie with Moreno. I just thought she made a great impression at the end of this. Like she's fantastic. And there, uh, I think by the time this comes out, the Rita Moreno documentary will Ooh. be available, which we played at SIF. And oh, it's, cool. It, it's it's yeah. very good. It's a very straightforward. What's it called? Do you know the title? Um, it, it's, it has an awkward title. It's Rita Moreno, Just a Girl Who Decided to Go For It. Okay. I think that's the name of it. I can check. You, right you know where, is it airing like on HBO or something? Or is it uh, I don't know. I, th I think it'll be VOD regardless. Oh, okay. Check it out. Uh, do you um, think we, they'll have? Do you think they'll have a segment on Colonel Knowledge? <laughs> Probably not. Um, 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 it, 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 I've seen the movie. I don't remember if it does. If it does, it was like five seconds because she's in so many things. Oh it's right. More about mm -hmm. um, her challenges because she, in her early career, she, she's one of the last remaining Golden Age actresses. Yeah, she's still um, with us. She's, she's won an Academy show. Award for West Side Story from 1961, so it's 60 years ago that yeah, film came out. She, she's an egot. EGOT winner, yeah, um, it, and she's a part of. She's in the new Spielberg West Side Story coming in December. Yeah, she's playing Doc. They rewrote it. Her character's name is Valentina, I believe. Oh, okay, because cool. Kushner, who knows, Mike Nichols, Tony Kushner, who obviously, uh, I mean, they work together. Do they work together more than just Angels in America? I know just they Angels. did Angels in America. Also has a tie to Nichols too. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's called Rita Moreno, just a girl who decided to go for it, and a lot of it is about how in her early career they kept on making her play different races she was okay. not and then trying to break out from that and finding that solace in broadway and in television mm -hmm. and um and in theater because now she lives in the berkeley hills and she does um, um one act, she does monologues at berkeley repertory theater oh cool yeah no she's fantastic and i want to you know make a project of, of look of seeking out more of Rita Moreno's film work would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, so before I get to my last question about the movie, Marcus, anything else you wanted to say about the performances, about Mike Nichols' direction that we did not touch on while kind of going through the movie kind of scene by scene? Anything else that we have not mentioned? I mean, as I said before, like Nichols just feels very, very confident here as a director. He's done three movies. The third film was like this kind of big, crazy production yeah. and kind of bringing back to his kind of natural tendencies as a director and, and kind of what he's familiar with what he's really really good at you know this this is definitely one of his best films like if you're a fan of Mike Nichols and you have somehow missed out on carnal knowledge like check it out it's a great cast really interesting story I really enjoyed it I totally agree I, I think we covered all my notes for it um yeah. it is you say you know it, it, he's very confident it's the first time in a film he's confident in my opinion okay because I, I mean, I love the first two films yeah. <laughs> he's he directed are great. Oh, without question. But yeah, there's something it just he feels a little bit more comfortable as a filmmaker in carnal knowledge. I don't yeah, know. He, he always knew how to work with <laughs> actors. Learning the film techniques took him a while. Yeah, exactly. So my last question about the movie, I ask of each guest, uh, what would this movie look like if made today? If someone were to remake carnal knowledge in 2021, I feel like a lot would have to change, right? Like, how would they make this now, this story, <laughs> do you think? I actually don't think a lot would have to change. But really? It, okay. It, as I said with, um, like, Bruce and McLeod, I think it would end up being, like, a streaming film from, yeah. like, a, a theater director who, who really wants to break into film to okay. show their stuff. Um, like, like a Boys in the certain, Band kind of thing, like, where they remake yeah. it 50 years later? Some From certain perspectives, yes, it's, it, it is dated, but it always, at, at no point are we supposed to like these men? If you like them, I think you're mm -hmm. watching it wrong, but also you can watch a film however you want. <laughs> and I can see how the film does have a bit of a male gaze to it. So they would fix that because we ogle over Bobby for a lot of the film. Mm -hmm. We do see Jack Nicholson in, in a towel pretty close to, to, to showing us his privates, but for the most part, he is clothed, which is which is part of the, the, the symbolism of the film. However, it is very clearly directed and written by men so mm -hmm. as you say the, the new version because the thing is what we do now is we expand stories instead of keeping them really tight we would get a lot more of the women they would be yeah. very they would be a part of part two very much we would see more from susan's perspective in part mm -hmm. one and yes. um the thing is a lot of like playwrights aren't really writing in this mode right now because this kind of mode did kind of come back in the 90s and early aughts but not so much anymore we are more interested in 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 magic superheroes in, in true reality no i mean like also in theater we're, we're not like domestic dramas don't quite look like this anymore yeah 
um, yeah, this would be a TV movie, or, or it, you know, it would start off as a festival film and then get bought by a streaming service, which is where all the all the good movies, for the most part, are now. All the mid-budget movies are mm. on streaming, but usually they've gone through the festival circuit. Like if I saw something like this. I, and it was from a new director. I would program it in a second in our mm -hmm. new American cinema competition. And I would mm -hmm. get maybe some some pushback that it feels a little outdated, but I'm like, but why does it feel that way? How can we engage with this? Because I want to engage with the movie. Even if mm -hmm. I don't love it, I want to discuss it. And this is a movie that if we told it now, we would discuss nonstop. Mm -hmm. Twitter would explode for a day for something like this. Oh, yeah. I would be interested in that i want that discussion because there's a difference between argument and discussion i love discussion mm -hmm. yeah absolutely carnal knowledge i almost feel like you could change it enough to where you could you wouldn't have to necessarily like obtain the rights to that script by jules pfeiffer i feel like just like the idea of the film i think you could do it in a way that's a little different that you like a film like a female director could like make it her own do something a little bit different but kind of have the same idea behind the movie i yeah, don't know like like, what would Sofia Coppola do with this? Ooh, like, yeah. So like, she, re not, she not, remade not the Beguiled. The big, yeah, yeah. And, and she completely rethought the Beguiled and yeah. made probably her second or third best film, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. Um, and, a like, film, say, remake, like, a, a remake of a 1971 movie directed by Don Siegel, directed by a man. Yep. Um, and, like, she is, like, our big female director. And I don't want to say, like, oh, that's the first one that comes to mind. No, she would make something like this. Um, yes. With On the Rock, she made like a lighter version of this, like her relationship with yeah. her father and her relationship with her husband and the paranoia of marriage and relationships itself, which has always been on her mind. That's why Marie Antoinette is such an interesting movie mm -hmm. because it is about a man trying to control a woman. The man is unfortunately a child in his brain and she mm -hmm. is the one who tries to be in control but can't because mm -hmm. the whole world is out to get her. Yeah, Act, I, I mean, actors would thing. imagine if Sofia Coppola showed interest in remaking Carnal Knowledge, actors would jump at that opportunity. I mean, it's yeah. such a rich script and you get to see the trajectory of these characters over 20 years. I mean, she would get a tremendous cast in this. I'd be curious to see. I would love I would love someone like her to take on this material in the next 10 years it would be really cool. Her or like or like a, a a gay female filmmaker like mm -hmm. the the, yeah. the person who played the person who played who made normal and prize winner of defiance ohio I yeah you could name. like you could swap genders you could make a diverse cat i mean you could do i you know, i i don't i don't know if like a version of this in 2021 with a white cast men and just just the two guys and i don't know like i'd like to see maybe some like something a little different today yeah you know the director I'm thinking of is Jane Anderson. Jane Anderson. Okay. So yeah, we'll see. I mean, you know, I've, I've talked about this on the podcast before. You're kind of like, no one's going to remake this. Like that won't probably happen yet, but stranger things have happened. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. All right, Marcus. So that takes us to our final two segments. The first one's called the divine double feature. That's where we pick a more modern film that would be paired well with carnal knowledge. What would you recommend to someone right when they finish Mike Nichols' carnal knowledge to put on as a second film for the night? Well, if you want to be dragged through hell a second time, um, <laughs> I have mentioned it before. Uh, Neil Butte is a very big fan of this movie, and you can tell, especially with his 1998 film, Your Friends and Neighbors, which is uh, Ben Stiller, Aaron Eckhart, Jason Patrick, Catherine yeah. Keener, Amy Brenneman, and Pasia Kinski. And he, in fact, screened this film for his cast as he was making it. Oh, he did. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, okay. I have I have a Neil Butte uh, biography. If you allow me to 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 say a yeah, couple uh, excerpts. This is wild, Marcus, because my choice is a also a Labute movie. Perfect. We, we, uh, we're on the same wavelength here. Of course, well, no, <laughs> it, it, he very clearly was inspired by this film. Yeah. Um, uh, about carnal knowledge, it's a film which explores that gap between the needs and expectations of men and women which is a product of something more than changing times, though these changes are reflected as the two men grow older and the world around them alters. Um, he, he screened this for them um, because of the honesty with which it approaches the nature of personal interactions. The film they were about to shoot shared certain concerns with Pfeiffer's script, notably the fascination with the performative component of identity, with sex as the assumed currency between men and women, with the game playing involved in relationships, betrayals, cruelties, self-concerns of characters who place themselves at the center of their own personal dramas. Interesting. Um, and Your Friends and Neighbors 
also only has six speaking roles and it doesn't feel mm-hmm. like it and you don't notice um it is it, um and it also they both end they both climax in very horrifying ways but one is a confession the other is the fight and so um Neil Abute is sort of outre now. He has been fired as the resident playwright of the Manhattan Theater Company or whatever okay. company. Yeah, has it he ha- made has he made a film in the last six, um, seven years? He is making TV shows for Netflix. Like he made that Lost ripoff like two, three years ago. Oh, okay. That nobody saw. But no, he his movies weren't coming out in theaters <laughs> past Wicker Man anyway. They were going to the Wicker to VOD. <laughs> That's right. I, I am the one person who likes the Wicker Man remake, unfortunately, <laughs> because I think people misread it, but also they have every right to misread his his plays and movies as misogynistic. I personally don't, but he was fired from MTC during the, the first wave of Me Too um, mm. um, cancellations, but I've looked and there's no evidence. Nobody said why he was fired. Oh, okay. So like so, 2017, 2018, he was like like fired from his job over some allegations? Yeah, um, that's where he's written the last like 15 years of his plays was this one theater company off Broadway. Oh, interesting. Um, So he still has a film career, but it's not coming out anymore. Mm. Like he's not remaking Death at a Funeral. He's not making any Aaron Eckhart movies. He's not making... Downview Terrace was that what it was called? The Samuel Jackson. Oh movie? right, Lake Lakeview Terrace. Lakeview Terrace. Samuel Jackson. Um, because clearly, like the, the, the movies I like of his were the ones that were based on his plays or at least inspired by his plays, which might bring us to your choice for a double <laughs> feature. Yeah, my choice was a film I saw at the Sundance Film Festival in 2005, and that's The Shape of Things. Have you seen The Shape of Things with Oh God uh, yes. with, with Weiss and Paul Rudd and Gretchen Mull? It's and, very, uh, I mean, it's obviously based on a play. It's like, I think it's just four speaking roles in the movie. Yep. The other um, guy is Fred Weller. I Frederick say. Weller, who Frederick played Weller. it on Broadway, and he is in Aaron Sorkin's To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh. Mockingbird. Mockingbird. He, um, Aaron Sorkin changes it so um, the, 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 the victim um, has, a, has an abusive husband, not an abusive father. Okay. And he 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 gets the he gets the centerpiece of Act One, which is the cross examination from Jeff Daniels from Atticus Finch. Yeah. So, pro- so one of my two or three most memorable Sundance Film Festival experiences was watching The Shape of Things in a giant theater called the Eccles Theater yeah. in Salt Lake City, or not Salt Lake City, in uh, Park City, for the Sundance Film Festival. And I'm not going to give it away because I want. I, I'm assuming a lot of our listeners have not seen that film. It kind of came and went. It wasn't like a big hit or anything. It didn't get any awards or anything at the end of 05 but where that movie goes in the last 20 minutes is so interesting and unexpected that I don't want to give it away here but just say it's you know it has some similar themes of carnal knowledge and relationships between men and women but it kind of flips it in the shape of things at the end and it's it's a wow of an ending let me tell you it is a very divisive film. That's where people <laughs> make their judgments on Neil Abu because they, in the, for the most part, don't really know his stuff beforehand or afterwards. They just think that is misogynist play. Where mm. actually he was challenged after writing the Company of Men in the Company of Men, his first film, yeah. which is about two men um, um, who have a bargain to pretend to fall in love with a, a deaf woman. Mm. Um, and he's like, they're like, you keep on making these these horrible men movies. Can you? flip that around yeah. <laughs> and then people don't know in context that that's why the shape of things exists out of context mm-hmm. i can see a very easy way to read it in a certain way that he just hates women and that comes up a lot in his other plays too however i don't think he likes men either at any mm-hmm. point no man has ever been a hero in any of his plays his 9-11 plays fat pig how to be pretty um, all of these, I've read a lot of his stuff, but now I can't talk about him much in theater because people aren't quite interested in his stuff anymore. Interesting. The Shape of Things is a very cool thing. Um, he got popular because of Bash, an off-Broadway play that they filmed for Showtime with Paul Rudd, Callista Flockhart, and Ron Eldard. Oh, okay. Three one-acts about Mormons gone wild, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, Shape of Things is his first Broadway show. Okay. And then he so, just so that, that over before he before he started his film career. He, like he yeah. had already written and they had performed the shape of things uh, shape so of things t- happens after your friends and neighbors and in the company of men oh okay but he has but, he has dual careers at the time kind of like Nichols is like doing both like he's making films he's directing theater 
And the shape of things, Labute was there for the Q and A. The whole cast was there, so all five of them were up on the stage. And in like every seat was taken in this giant theater. And I raised my hand. <laughs> and to Labute, who was standing there answering questions, I said, "Yes, hi." I kind of went like this. I have a question for Paul. <laughs> and I, I'll never forget the look on Labute's face. He kind of looked at me like, kind of narrowed his eyes and stepped aside Whatever, paul man. rudd comes up i said so paul who was the better kisser in this movie rachel or gretchen <laughs> and he said fred <laughs> i really love that movie that was my last review for the loyolan i believe your last review for the loyolan was the shape I graduated because i can't remember when it opened like theatrically was it that spring was it later in 2005 uh, yeah late spring 05 so like May. okay because like yeah, that was my last review and I've seen it on stage twice. Um, colleges love to do it because it's cheap to produce. Cheap to produce. It's, 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 it's very, <laughs> it's, it's very pointed and vicious and it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an actor showcase. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great play, but I can see why that mode of storytelling isn't popular anymore because, yeah. oh my God, it's cynical. Oh my it's God. It's very cynical. It's not a movie you're walking out like snapping your fingers, joking. <laughs> but Rachel movie, Weiss like, oh. is incredible in it. Yeah. The, the year she won an Academy Award for The Constant Gardener was 2005, mm -hmm. which is, I remember a, a solid film, solid performance, but the one that I will always remember of her, at least in, you know, 15, 16 years ago, was The Shape of, Shape of Things. She's great in that movie. So check it out. Uh, I also was thinking because of that fight scene a little bit, I was thinking of Before Midnight. I mean, that would be a great, I think, second film too. I mean, yeah. looking at obviously a couple where things are working a little bit better for them in Before Midnight than they are in Carnal Knowledge, but kind of the nature of the fight in at the end of Before Midnight was also an idea. And then I thought if you wanted to do it kind of moving into our final segment, Beyond the Flick, about the career of Mike Nichols, would you agree that a really cool second film after Carnal Knowledge would be to watch Closer? Yes. Right? So let's oh, go, yes. let's talk about Mike Nichols and his career. Closer, also, uh, his second to last film. Yeah. Right? It should should have been his last film because he ends with Charlie Wilson's War. Which I didn't. kind of misdirects. And I, I like Aaron Sorkin as a writer, despite his his trappings. Yeah. But it is not a good movie to end on. I actually yeah, Closer should have been, the that would have been the perfect yeah. ending. I actually had a second double feature film. Oh, um, go for it. But um, so throughout this movie, the characters keep saying bullshit artists to each other, which I've only heard constantly said in one other movie, and that's The Greasy Strangler from 2016, the Jim Hoskin movie. Throughout the movie, the father and the son, who are always naked and covered in grease, keep screaming that phrase to each other throughout the entire film. And it, for some reason, I guess it's a reference to Carnal Knowledge, which I didn't realize until just oh. now. Well, and, and that's a that's a really weird movie it's sort of a serial killer movie it's sort of a cringe comedy it's sort of a romance if you're not into like underground if you're not into john waters stuff don't watch this oh okay but, um, <laughs> he, um jim hoskins made greasy strangler and an evening with beverly left lynn the aubrey plaza movie which is also okay. super weird and feels like serial mom's son oh cool i love sir so what are the titles that you just said I, so, i'm not familiar um, with them the Greasy Strangler. The Greasy Strangler from 2016. Where can we find that? Is that on it's, it's, streaming? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What and was then, the one with Audrey Plaza? An Evening with Beverly Left Lynn. It's Aubrey Plaza, Emile Hirsch, Meg Stoll from John Waters' movies. And Beverly Left Lynn is played by Craig Robinson. It is a very bizarre, what? dry comedy. When did that come out? You know, um, 2018. 2018. 2018. 2018. Yeah. And the, the director, he's a British director, Jim Hosking, H-O-S-K-I-N-G. Okay. And they are super weird. And if you don't <laughs> like them, I totally understand. They are very niche. Okay. I have not heard of either one. I will have to check those. I mean, that second one, I love Emile Hirsch. I love Aubrey Plaza. I will definitely check that one out. Cool. Yeah. All right. So Mike Nichols, you remember what the first movie of his he directed that you saw? Uh, let me look at this. Like I um, was 11 years old and my grandparents took me to see the birdcage in the spring of 96. Right. Um, <laughs> that was my introduction to Mike, Mike Nichols. I had seen Wolf before that. I know okay. that much. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think Wolf and birdcage are my first two Mike Nichols movies. Now, if okay. I'm looking at his filmography. Yeah. Um, um, and, and, and now, and now you have watched all of them. Yes. Um, what what are like so yeah talk about like you know your your connection to him and his work and 
which films you love, maybe which films you don't like so much. Well, would be fun. I would say to save time about my obsession with his theater career, just okay. read Mark Harris's book. Um, yes. Because all these things you you take for granted from theater, at least through Mark Harris's perspective, seems to originate with Mike Nichols and his people and mm -hmm. his colleagues. Um, um, in the book, he talks about um, being in the same theater troupe in college as Joy Carlin, mm -hmm. and then he, uh, a, a woman he quite loved as a friend, and then when he made The Graduate and shot the sequences in Berkeley, where I am from, he hung out with Joy Carlin. I didn't know she knew her. I worked as a PA on a play she did at the Aurora Theater Company in Berkeley, California. Oh, cool. The small theater next to Berkeley Rep. Okay. Um, so I had no idea, and it was called uh, Hysteria. <laughs> it is about the the fictional meeting between Salvador Dali and Freud at the end mm -hmm. of Freud's life. So I'm the person making all the weird surreal things happen, pulling down the walls to make them look like they're melting, um, changing out a phone with a lobster and like holding a train light to kill everybody. It was a bizarre thing. And I had no idea she worked with Nichols and was one of his colleagues for 60 years. 60 years. Wow. Um, That's interesting. Uh, and uh, my relationship with his films, as aforementioned, he is one of the few people to really get how theater can look on film mm -hmm. without seeming stagey. I'm okay with staginess because, honestly, when when sound was introduced, for a good 10, 15 years, movies looked stagey because mm -hmm. they couldn't move the camera again for a while because it was too bulky. Yeah. Um, and they couldn't, you know, the, the sound was just everywhere, all the recording <laughs> devices. Um, he has a way of making silly things very real and getting under their skin and communicating that that with you even with something like working girl which i feel is way more dated than carnal knowledge okay he still gets you to love these people who are making these weird mistakes from a, from a project that is very clearly made by men mm -hmm. um yeah i love the way he works with actresses Mm -hmm. um, just tremendous I mean I mean you look at his career and just you know in film not even in theater and just the, the the quality of the actors he gets for movie after movie is just extraordinary yeah. I mean even a movie like The Birdcage he gets like an amazing cast for that movie so even good. when he's doing a comedy right and he, yeah and, and that was a return to form for him um, oh yeah because he made he had made Wolf, Wolf. Was like, yeah whatever <laughs> and, and I kind of like Wolf but it doesn't work as like a horror film it works as a comedy yeah, I don't know if I've seen Wolf. It was on the Criterion channel and I was going to watch really? it and, I, and I, just got, I just got busy. I, I don't think I've seen Wolf. I think you should, that, you that's should see I... it. It's so silly. <laughs> and he realizes it's silly because he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not pretentious about it. He learns throughout the seventies and early eighties to not be pretentious. Like he, he makes Silkwood in 83, you know, seven years after he made his previous film or eight years. And he realizes that, you know, the story is about Karen Silkwood, a sleepwalker, like metaphorically waking up. And afterwards mm. he realized he was just waking up too. Yeah. So he stops being a pretentious filmmaker through his earlier films. Yeah. I would say like, I'm looking at the list now. There's only four movies of his I straight up do not like. Okay, what are those? That is, that is What Planet Are You From? Oh God. Which is not which his is, fault. Which is a great chapter in Harris's book, by the way. Oh my God. And, and, and also in the, uh, the Judd Apatow, Gary Shandling documentary on HBO. Which oh, is, they talk about it in that oh, too? Yes. Um, also okay. Judd Apatow's best film by a long shot. And I like Judd Apatow. What's that documentary called? It's, 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 it's a, it's a film made by Gary Shandling. Shandling. Oh, it's about Gary Shandling. Oh, that yeah, Judd Apatow made. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, after he made Trainwreck. Oh, between cool. Between Trainwreck and the Pete Davidson movie. And it is called like the Karma Diaries. Okay. Cause Shandling passed away in what, 2016, 2017, somewhere in there? Uh, before yeah, that yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't remember yeah. um, um it's called the zen diaries of gary shandling it is in two parts okay. i think it's incredible yeah and what planet are you from is is you know near the end yeah he um, basically I, took that movie for the paycheck right wasn't that yes. what harris wrote about <laughs> it, it was and gary shandling had never been controlled by anybody else in that way before and yeah. so it was just a mismatch from day one day one and Nich nichols just kept on going because that's what you do yeah as aforementioned i do not like the fortune even though apparently the cone brothers consider it one of their favorites mm -hmm. and you know yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued about it i i, I want to check it out but um, yeah i haven't heard great things about the fortune i don't like regarding henry that much yeah it's fine it's like it's fine. i mean it's like i feel like that's a movie anyone could have directed like there's no real stamp that he puts on regarding henry 
Right, like that's what I'm saying, like phone it in. Yeah. <laughs> Wolf, he doesn't quite phone it in. He phones it in here from a J.J. Abrams script, Jeffrey Abrams at the time. Yes. And mm-hmm. I, watch, I watched it for the first time like two weeks ago. It is the most straightforward thing. Regarding Henry? Ever made, yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, Day of the Dolphin is not a good movie, but I enjoyed it. Okay. I enjoyed watching it. Um, also learning that it's Tracy Morgan's favorite film made it really funny. <laughs> because... Because that's a wonderful chapter in Mark Harris's book. Yeah. But like, even though Mike Nichols very explicitly had a no a hole policy, he cast George C. Scott in this role mm-hmm. after working with him on stage and having a miserable time. Yeah. Oh, that's he fascinating did this to too. Himself. Um. But Day of the Dolphin, literally, the dolphins are talking throughout the entire movie in these <laughs> weird childlike voices, and it is so freaking funny and weird. It's not a good movie, but you have never seen anything like it. You should read um, Pauline Kale's review of it. She's like, "This is like a Lassie film, but the joy has been sucked out." Why would children watch this? I don't think it's pitched at children, so she's wrong. But that's okay. But it's a it's it's a very depressing kids kids. It, like, it's it, not a is it a kids movie. Oh, is it a movie aimed at kids? Is that what Nichols was doing with Day of the Dolphin? Who knows? Is it well, like it, Flipper? It, it, <laughs> well, Pauline Kale sometimes gets it wrong, but she writes her reviews incredibly regardless. Yeah. But, um, um, somebody has been posting her reviews on Letterboxd as not Pauline Kale, so you can read oh snippets. You can read her reviews. Um, as you're searching for these movies and they're always yeah they're I've there. come across Kale some of her books are at like the library and I've like read some of her stuff but it's yeah it's harder to find her work online than say like Roger Ebert who has like every review he ever wrote it's like right there you just click on but uh, yeah. Kale but Kale's reviews are really fun to read too so um Day of the Dolphin is I think it's worth a watch but it's yeah. it should be something that should be super fun and it's not yeah, and we should um, mention real quick, a really interesting piece of the Harris book too, is that after The Fortune, he went into production, Mike Nichols, on a film with Robert De Niro, right? What was it called? If Bogart Sleeps Again or something like that? Something about Bogart's in the title? And yeah. like, they shut down the production, like after they had started working on the movie. And then he doesn't work, he, do, he doesn't uh, work in film as a director. He, he like directed a Gildner Radner uh, like stage show, right? In 1980, Guild, yeah, Guild, Guild Alive. Alive. Yes, and he said he only wanted to like just move the camera around. He's like, thank God I can shoot something and not have to worry about the script because it had yeah. already been a sellout crowd at the Winter Garden. Yeah. So his first movie back after that is, is Silkwood. And that's definitely one of my favorite Nichols movies. It's my favorite of the three films he directed Meryl Streep in. What do you think of Silkwood? Silk, I saw it for the first time like three weeks ago. A very strong. Oh, you've never seen it. Oh, cool. No, um, because that this is what eighty three. I was I was one. You were one, <laughs> so you weren't at the theater watching Silk. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, my parents did bring me to the theater. Um, my mom says my first movie is Forty Eight Hours, which was within a month of my birth. And um, she, <laughs> okay. speaking of Meryl Street, my mom said she took me to Sophie's Choice, but I was crying, and so she had to leave. And she jokes, now I. I never knew what Sophie's choice was. <laughs> I don't think, did my parents take me to a theater my first year at, uh, on this earth? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think my mom would have taken me to Sophie's choice. <laughs> Silkwood, Silkwood is a great movie about America. Um, the chapter yep. on it is wonderful because of uh, all the lawsuits surrounding it because the nuclear company yeah. um, got on his ass and made him change the ending and change some names and change some facts. And the book posits that it's the first docudrama of its kind to talk about current events in a very in a very journalistic way, which a lot of people mm-hmm. th- said, that's not what film is for. He's like, mm-hmm. it is now. Yeah, also it's an important the- film for Nora Ephron. She co-wrote the script with Alice Arlen for Silkwood, mm-hmm. and that kind of started right her film career. Had she did. written anything before that? Um, I don't know. Not for film. She, for film. she was like, she was a New Yorker columnist or something yeah. like that. And then and then Heartburn happens, and that becomes controversial. Mandy Patinkin gets Mandy fired Patinkin. after a week, and mm-hmm. J- Jack Nicholson comes in with three days prep. Yeah, um, and only if he can get a certain amount of money, the studio crunched the numbers and says yes, Jack Nicholson is worth the money he's asking for. Mm-hmm. Um, again, playing playing a very Jewish character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Mike Nichols works with Nicholson four times on film. That's the other one we haven't mentioned is Heartburn from 86, which is a movie I want to love because it's got two of my favorite actors of all time and it's Nichols and it's Efron. I watched it like three times over the last 10 years and I'm just like, it's, it's, it's fine. weird. It's weird. <laughs> 
like the scene where she's at the she's getting her hair styled and she realizes that her husband's been cheating on her and she goes home and and they have that argument that's a great segment of the movie but there's a lot of parts of it i'm like eh, it's okay so one but, of my favorite um but like uh, uh, um overall um the, the movies I love of his most, like my top three. Yeah. If what not, are your top three, Mike Nichols? If we're not counting carnal knowledge, okay. all my stuff skews pretty modern. So I apologize for people who, you know, th- there's a recency bias there. But um, <laughs> so I, I would, I would say in third, there's a tie for third place. So okay. the birdcage with an audience or with your friends really, so really works. <laughs> By yourself, it doesn't quite work. Um, as much, I, I rewatched it yesterday. Okay. I, th- I think most of the stuff with Gene Hackman in the first half could have been cut. Oh, that's a kind of interesting point. I Yeah, I did a 25th anniversary bonus episode with a guest on the birdcage. And I, on the episode, I'm like, I'm trying to find things negative to say about this movie. I mean, it, I so love fun. the birdcage. It's it's a blast. It's I agree. There's maybe a little bit too much of Hackman in the beginning. But so I, the, I find him adorable in that movie. I really yeah, like him. No, he's really good in it. Um, <laughs> uh, Elaine May did a great job um, um, adapting it from La Cage Afo. But in La Cage, yeah. they are not politicians. They're just conservative people. Oh, okay. The other family. So she brought all that stuff in, and it's a little dated. But in 1996, it was wonderful. Yeah. The movie's a little dated, too. But most people who say that are straight people. Because mm-hmm. um, um, for, for, for all my, all my LGBTQ friends... Mm-hmm. It is such a part of their personality because it was a film that understood them mm-hmm. yeah. which, to a very large degree, um, made Nathan Lane a full star and not mm-hmm. just a cartoon voice. Yeah, um, took, and took it's, gay characters seriously in a major, really major way. Yeah, and, and lovely. And the jokes really work. Hank Azaria, of course, is, you know, he's not doing brown face but he's yeah, doing brown little... accent but he, he, swears, still he, hilarious. Asks, he <laughs> swears he asks his gay friends and they said, that's fine. Yeah. Because he the bow the bow he does is one of my favorite parts of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's wonderful in it. Um, I, I actually I had ordered a shirt for this podcast, but it didn't come in in time. That said, get me my Pirin tablets. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it didn't come. Okay, so what's what's the other one tied for third place? So, uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? People screaming at each other for three hours. Well, it's two hours in the movie. Um, it is my favorite <laughs> mid-century play. I, I found the play in, in college. Mm-hmm. The, the reason I'm a little tepid on it is that the play is a comedy. It is hilarious. The movie is not. The movie f- misses. It doesn't miss most of it. I thought it missed it. And then I read the Mark Harris book. And he says we cut it down from this because the comedy is an exchange with a theater audience mm. to sort of diffuse the tension because it's a three-act play with two intermissions. It is three hours long and you need that. When you cut yeah. it down to two hours, two hours ten, you need to increase the tension the entire time. Interesting. But I so I did you ever get did you ever see that on stage? Oh, you yeah. have. Yes. Um, so I saw it on Broadway with Bill Irwin, um, David Kathleen, Harbour. Kathleen Turner. Okay. Kathleen Turner had an understudy that day. Oh, okay. And her understudy was incredible. Okay. Um, so it was her, Bill Irwin, David Harbour, and Marae Enos from uh, Big Love and that 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 crime show I never watched. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the Killing. The Killing. Um, and then I saw it at Seattle Rep with Pamela Reed. Okay. Who's wonderful. Um, and and you just think you just think it works better on stage than it does you, in the film. Yes, because well, also you're just in their 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 living room the entire time. Mm-hmm. The movie keeps on leaving their house to like go to a bar, to go to mm-hmm. a park, to go to a swing set. And and that and because it's a movie, that happens. Yeah. So as a movie, free of context, it is great. The fact that it's his first movie and he figures it all out, it looks beautiful, and that he managed to make it with the most famous couple in the world. Who are being harangued by the press every single day? The fact and do and do some of their best work, and and she's playing great. she's playing twenty years older than she is, yeah. and nails it. Yeah, it's the first time I realized how good of an actor she is, and now I look at all of her other stuff. She's tremendous. She's not mm-hmm. a megastar. She's a goddamn actress. She's she's just so glamorous, so beautiful, and for her to do that for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, it's just so so interesting. With, that she would take on that role yeah. with her. Were they, were, were they married at the time? With I don't the, know if they were married, Jennifer? but they were finally open about the relationship because yeah. they hooked up during Cleopatra and said, we're not. 63. We're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They said like, yeah, we're not a couple. At this point, this I think this is their first movie. I don't remember if Sam Piper is before or after. 
They did uh, so. Cleopatra was sixty three, and then the VIPs was sixty three. I believe they made they made the VIPs after Cleopatra, okay? Because that's the film they met on was Cleopatra, and then they're in like what seven films together throughout the six. Like they're in a bunch of movies together, and I think the best one by far is Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And then I know that when they were filming on campus, um, they had to have bodyguards because the students would not leave them alone. Oh gosh. <laughs> Which is and super- yeah it's one of the last major films shot in black and white right before like 68 69 where black and white is just like out there's no academy yeah. award nomination yeah. for the cinematography yeah. anymore but i love i love the look of black and white films of the 60s they're just so striking they're so gorgeous um but yeah um read the play if you haven't it is uproarious and also mm-hmm. it is fouler than the film could be so he had to make yeah. he had to make some cuts um because the play is so notorious for its language and sexual content that the Pulitzer Committee did not give out a drama prize that year because they knew if they did, it would have to go to Virginia Woolf. Yeah. They decided just not to give out a prize that year. Interesting. So they just didn't give a prize? Like not sometimes they don't give a Pulitzer for- S- Sometimes they don't. <laughs> um, my second favorite- Oh, but well, one, one more oh, thing. One before, oh, right. one more thing. How cool would it have been, Marcus, to have seen Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on stage with Elaine May and Mike Nichols up there performing the two oh, leads. God. How cool would that the, have been? The, the one that they had to cut short because he had pneumonia. Yeah, he only did um, it, I want to say, for like six weeks or something, yeah. and they were going to do more, and then he got sick, and then they they just called it quits. On the documentary I watched, Bob Balaban says it's the best performance of George there has ever been because really? he got it. So, But like in the book, we learn a lot about Nichols and May, and they have, I forget the name of the act, but during their, mm-hmm. their stand-up career, their duo career, they had an act where they kept on like fighting with each other and building and saying vicious things until like they were both crying, and then they would snap off and say the name of the act like it's the mm-hmm. aristocrats. Yeah. Um, and in Mark Harris's book, they said sometimes while doing Virginia Woolf, they they approached that and they got a little too raw with each other, mm-hmm. and that he they they were friends hurting each other. So the pneumonia, I'm sure he had it, but it's a convenient way to lead the project because you're reuniting mm-hmm. with your best friend, yeah, and hurting her every night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I don't I know. I, that was, I I had no idea that he and May had performed that on stage. What was that around like 1980 somewhere around there? Like before he made Silkwood, I think. Also, but, uh, um, cool. three, three, uh, three, Nicole, three Nichols and May albums are on iTunes. I downloaded all three of them. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you, like, I know there's some clips I've seen, like, on YouTube of their show, but, like, like you can actually download some of their albums. Yeah, uh, three on of iTunes. them. It's, um, it's, it's um, uh, um, In the Evening with Nichols and May, which is their mm-hmm. Broadway show um, in 1960, Improvisations to Music in 1959. Okay. And then Nichols and May Examine Doctors, which was their improv on that uh, public access radio show. Okay. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah those, those are all on iTunes. It's so interesting how their careers are so intertwined. I mean, they start together on stage and, and recording these shows, and they became very famous and very rich, right, by the yeah. early 60s. And then Elaine May would go on to perform with him on stage and Virginia Woolf. And then she collaborates with him on both The Birdcage and Primary Colors. Elaine and, May yeah. uh, got an Oscar nomination for her screenplay of Primary Colors, which- It's a, good, it's a really good screenplay. And uh, uh, unfortunately the film was killed by the Lewinsky scandal. And, yep. and that's in the book too. They're like, we have something incredible. Oh, oh it, it pales <laughs> comparison to, to reality, oops. Yeah. And Elaine May's career is so fascinating too as a director. Oh, we just lover. talked about her first film a few months ago, A New Leaf, which came out in March of 71 with mm-hmm. Walter Matthau, which like some interesting, uh, you know, research I did behind that movie and how like she she had a three hour version she was cutting together and the, they were like, no, you got to cut it down. We need it. And she wanted her name off the movie. She does The Heartbreak Kid. Heartbreak Kid with Neil Simon. My Neil Nichols Simon. Buddy. Charles Grodin, who, we, who just passed away, mm-hmm. is the star of that. That came out in 72, which I'm excited to talk about that in a few months. And then she has... Film two films that don't do as well. She uh, makes Mikey and Nikki in 76. Is that with John Cassavetes and Peter Falk? I, uh, that sounds right. I have I not think. seen it. And then that didn't do very well. Her career as a director in film is kind of over, but Warren Beatty brings her back for Ishtar of all movies in 87. <laughs> Which I really like. Which is a fun movie. I saw it, it a is. few years ago. I liked it a lot. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> It's, and <laughs> I she, think it's kind of charming, you know, it's it kind of silly. Um, and she's still a great playwright and yep. recently won a Tony in a play I saw. 
Um, sh- uh, a couple years ago, she was in the Waverly Place. The Waverly Gallery? The, the Waverly Gallery. The Waverly yeah. Gallery, the revival of Kenneth Lonergan's off-Broadway play mm-hmm. with uh, Lucas Hedges, Joan yeah. Allen, and Michael Sarah. I, oh, it was, man. You saw it with them? I saw I saw their closing weekend, uh, January of 2018. Oh, wow. What was that like? Oh, tell, me, tell me about, tell me about, yeah, tell me about watching uh, Elaine May in that show. What was that like? I didn't love the play, okay. um, but it, it was, um, I forget the director. She had just come off The Wolves, which is one of the great recent plays. Okay. Um, it's a little stodgy and it's an older play and all of his older plays are being revived. Like Lobby Hero was revived for, for Broadway. Okay. But she holds down the, the center of this this memory play as, a, as an older woman um, with dementia. Mm. So she's playing she's not playing it for comedy she's playing it for not not tragedy either it's just really real and raw and she deserved that tony mm-hmm. among over anybody else because without her it all just sort of spins out of control so I, but i was there closing weekend so joan allen's ex-husband who was tony nominated for ragtime is sitting next to me kenneth Lonergan is across the aisle from me <laughs> oh talking, wow all, talking with oliver platt in the row in front of him <laughs> <laughs> and then Joan Allen's um, ex-husband, he like waves, Cherry, Cherry, hey. And then Cherry Jones comes up and like talks over me, like leaning <laughs> over me. And, my, and I, I turned to him and I said, oh, that Cherry. <laughs> wow. But Who's who is, of uh, actors there? Elaine, it's it, it's a hard role to describe, but it, it, it is a, it is about uh, generations and what we hold on to and what art means to people. Mm-hmm. And uh, she is just exquisite yeah. in that play. And Harris talked about how I, did he say like I wasn't even sure I could write the book on Nichols if I couldn't interview Elaine May he really needed to talk to her and he said I think it was on Colbert he said that was the person he needed to get for the book oh, to make course. it successful and he did and she's all over the book from beginning to end and, and uh, you know just a fantastic career herself too my my second favorite second favorite Nich- Nichols what do we got is closer closer it's from 2004 being- People being vicious to each other. Oh, it's it's so good. It's so pointed. <laughs> Everybody nails it. I would have loved to see Kate Blanchett in that role, but Julia Roberts mm-hmm. is great in it. Mm-hmm. She is like the fourth wheel in it. I know yeah. that um because everybody else sort of acting circles around her but she really mm-hmm. holds her own um and he had to change the ending from test screenings because the play is a little lighter on what happens to people okay um, but it um it is just full of the most incredible one-liners mm-hmm. and the one that always like sticks with me is um have you ever seen a human heart it looks like a fist covered in blood who says Holy that in the movie clive owen the doctor clive owen. <laughs> wow. and also it has so it's a lot like carnal knowledge. It has the time jumps because it takes place over several years. Okay. And from scene to scene, years will pass or months will pass. And that feels a lot like carnal knowledge. That's why I think Patrick Marber, the playwright and eventual screenwriter, has seen carnal knowledge or at least what it inspired. Mm-hmm. Um, it is just for, I love domestic dramas about people spiraling, mm-hmm. but trying not to. Yeah. Um, it is very, it's Natalie Portman, the best she's ever been. She's mm-hmm. always in control. And Mike Nichols adored her. He was like a father figure to her. He used mm-hmm. her again in the Shakespeare in the Park version of the Seagull with Seagull. Meryl and Philip and John <laughs> yeah. and, and everybody. Stacked cast in the Seagull. Uh, closer is, it's it, like, it's like, again, it's not for everybody, but. Mm-hmm. If you are that kind of person, it's hard to do better because movies don't quite look like that anymore. Yeah. It, it yeah, I mean, it's 2004, 2004, 2004, kind of a different time. And uh, Jude Law is the other actor in that film, right? Yeah. Jude, the the um, year of Jude Law, he was in like six films in 04. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it, it, and, and that was an interesting year because that, that was also The Aviator and I think Alfie and just all these crazy things. Yep. Um, uh, did you number- review? Did you review Closer for the Loyola? Because so, that came out in uh, December of 04. So do, do you want the story behind this? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> okay, so um, another writer, I will not say their name. I don't think you know him. Um, we ran his review of it, and then I noticed it didn't quite sound like him. It was a little too smart for him. And then I Googled it, <laughs> and he had stolen paragraphs from the San Jose Mercury. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And, and I, I approached him. I was a little arrogant about it. Yeah. So I apologize. But I said, like, here are the two reviews. Here's yours. Here's this. This is a legal problem. It's not that I'm mad. It's that we could get sued yeah. for this. This is copyright infringement. And he apologized. But our media advisor used those two pages as um, he used it 
talking to um, editors down the line at the yeah. level one of how to spot plagiarism. And actually, actually, I had the, the weird idea. It was actually my wife who actually did the research because and she found it within seconds. Oh, it's still like you can look it up now. Like yeah, well, well, she 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 just knew which thing to look for, and now she's a professor and has her own oh, okay. plagiarism, which she now has to legally report to the university. Yeah. Oh, um, so, wild. So, so we okay. ran a we ran a review. I knew somebody felt off, but I still ran it because we didn't have time. Mm -hmm. And then and then detective mode happened. Detective mode happened. You should have hired me to write that one, Marco. I, 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 I would I have not have plagiarized a word. I know. I believe you. <laughs> um, and so my number one. Number I'm one. Sure you, I'm sure you anticipate this because you emailed me after you watched it and says, I see why you chose this as your number one film of 2004, Angels in America. Angels in America. Yeah. Which is which, not a film. Which is not a film, I, but I put it on film. its own. I put it on its own little category. Like, <laughs> like it's it's this other piece of, I mean, it's, it's considered by most, right? The best thing Mike Nichols ever did. Angels it's in America. It's just so incredible. I, I had read the play. Um, I was working... The, uh, at Loyola Marymount's um, student-run theater, the Delray Players, and mm -hmm. I was reading it during Barefoot in the Park when I was a PA on that. I was doing sound on that, so oh, on, okay. on Simon Mike Nichols thing, and, <laughs> I, and I read I read both parts while I was up in that booth, and I thought, this is the most incredible thing I've ever read. It's a cliche now to call Angels one of the great American plays of the last 35 years, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And Mike Nichols found every, every angle into it. He did everything right. He cast it perfectly. Um, it is so heartrending and and life affirming, mm -hmm. and um, and it's it's easy to get angels wrong. I've seen bad productions, mm. um, but everything he does with that is a perfect synergy between theater, film, and television. I usually don't like HBO's movies. They're usually old fashioned white people wool crap. Mm -hmm. But th this this. I don't know how to how to say enough great words about his production of Angels. Hmm. I, and I love that it led to his relationship with Tony Kushner and that it led to Mark Harris. Because mm -hmm. when we get to that chapter in the biography, I'm like, oh, I wonder why he has so much insight. Oh, wait, he's married to Tony Oh, he's Kushner. married to Tony Kushner. <laughs> yeah. Which I knew. It was a joke, but yeah. Which I think, yeah, um, I think he said that was like, there were two chapters he was kind of struggling with. The Graduate, because he'd already written about that for his first book. And then Angels in America, because he's so close to the playwright, you know, as yeah. his husband. But it's, it's you don't see it on the page. He did a great job. It's just wonderful. And and the the missing one, obviously, is The Graduate, which I really, really like. I think it's dated. And I think it's easy to, re I think the second half doesn't quite work. Because Benjamin is not really a nice person. And you see him <laughs> yeah. follow her, uh, um, Elaine. Is that the daughter's El name? Elaine, yeah. Yeah, and he's being kind of a creepy stalker. Yeah. In 1960-whatever, it seems like even Ebert, like he loved, like, this is a movie of our generation, and then 30 years later, he rewatched and says, yeah. oh, this Three guy's stars. an idiot. <laughs> Three stars. Um, and also, <laughs> the graduate, um, so I took an Academy of Art class in high school mm -hmm. in San Francisco, and that was the movie we analyzed frame by frame, scene by scene. So I can only watch it through that analytical lens and I can't watch it as a movie. Okay. So, cause he tries all these weird little tricks. Yeah, The Graduate would be like four or five on my list. I love that movie. I love the first half. Like yes. the first half to me is just movie brilliance. I love every second. Once Mrs. Robinson is like kind of out of the movie and it's about him pursuing Elaine, I, it's fine. I don't, Th that's an example of a movie that doesn't quite stick the landing in the second half. It just no. like there's some parts I like in this in the last 45 minutes, but uh, I mean the, the the first the opening stuff with Mrs. Robinson and the way that the film is shot and cut together is really interesting. I remember at LMU we studied a lot of uh, The Graduate in like sound design class and editing and stuff. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an important cool film. Yeah, you kind of uh, you kind of have to see it if you're interested in the work of Mike Nichols. You kind of have to see The Graduate. That's the only film he won an Academy Award for. Kind of crazy. And it, it's a miracle that it even is a, is a cohesive film, knowing what we know from both Pictures at a Revolution and Mike Nichols' mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Um, the fact that you know he got that performance out of Dustin Hoffman, who was uncomfortable the entire time and had no idea what he was doing and thought he was the wrong guy from day one. Yeah. The one time that you know <laughs> it, it's the opposite problem of Jack Nicholson playing Jewish characters. Here's Dustin Hoffman playing a wasp. Mm -hmm. But that actually works because he's supposed to stand outside of this stupid SoCal mm -hmm. um, previous generation life. Yeah. And so real quick. Oh, yeah. 
Go for it. So I just want to say my my top three, you've already mentioned them. Uh, Before I get to those, two other Nichols films I really like that we haven't mentioned are Postcards from the Edge with Shirley MacLaine and Meryl Streep. That's a great movie if you haven't seen it. And uh, 2001, right before Angels in America, Wits with Emma Thompson. It's a hard watch. It's a hard watch. But I just looked at it again for its 20th anniversary. Uh, You know, for the podcast, we talk about 50-year-old movies. I also, just for fun on my own time, I look at a lot of films that uh, from 20 years ago. I try to pick stuff I had not seen. I had never seen Wit with uh, Emma Thompson. And I-, I was like, this film is incredible. I'm surprised not a lot of people really talk about it anymore. I mean, talk about an incredible performance from, from uh, Emma Thompson and that. And a very kind of just, you know, understated directing job. You know, it's based on a play, right? It's like, it's, it's you know, it's a lot of her talking to the camera but if you have never seen or heard of Wits from 2001, it was an HBO movie. It's on HBO Max. Check it out. It's worth your time. It's really It's so good. And that gave him the confidence yeah. to make Angels in America. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. he found a way in to translate it and open it up because he, he it's a memory play. And he's he ended up being very good about memory plays. Um mm-hmm. And, and, and he opened up a new way of shooting things. And like you said, you know, the people looking down the barrel of the camera, Emma Thompson talks to us. Jack Nicholson and Art Garfunkel talk to us in Carnal Knowledge. Right. Mm-hmm. News in America is a lot of that, especially the mm-hmm. ending when Justin Kirk, uh, prior yeah. Walter, is giving mm-hmm. the final speech, which, you know, breaks my freaking heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Wit is wonderful. After it won all the Emmys, people stopped talking about it. It is revived a lot. The play okay. is still very well respected, but mm-hmm. people forgot about the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he was considering Meryl Streep for Wit, but she had just been in One True Thing, where she was dying of cancer in that film from 98. So then he went to Emma Thompson, who he'd, he had worked with on Primary Colors. And then he would get both Emma Thompson and Meryl Streep in Angels in America, the next project. Playing but- smaller roles. God bless them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, if I were to consider Angels in America a movie, that would be number one for me too. I mean, that movie is just extraordinary. It's, how long is it? Is it four hours or six hours? It's, it's, it's six hours. Six it's hours. Two, it's two three-hour films. It was shown on a Monday and a Tuesday. Okay, two three-hour films. And a so I, I've only revisited it once, like five or six years ago. I got it from the library. They had the DVD set and I watched it again and I was just bowled over once again. I mean, just what a, what a great piece of filmmaking that is. So I would consider that number one. If I didn't put... Angels, Angels in America as a movie, my top three would be The Birdcage, Silkwood, and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Like, I know not necessarily like first, second, or third place. Those are just the three that I really love. Like, if I could only take three with me somewhere, if not counting Angels in America, obviously, that would be included as well. I just think it's interesting to look at his career in the 60s, in the 80s, in the 90s. Some filmmakers, they have this small window of great work, and then there's like 20 more years of films they direct, and they're of no interest mike nichols from the beginning to the end in theater and in film was always just doing fantastic work and not every movie he does is great i mean we've mentioned a couple but uh, i mean look at look at what he accomplished in in his life and read mark harris's book it's it's truly extraordinary and i'm so happy one of the last few films of his i've not seen was carnal knowledge i'm so excited i got to talk with you about it today marcus and finally get to see this movie also one of the few films of Jack Nicholson's I had not seen before. And I, I would put this, if not number three, number four, like in my top five of Nichols, I, I'm going to revisit this movie again. I really loved it. Cool. Glad yeah. to hear it. <laughs> so as we wrap up here, Marcus, anything else you'd like to promote or anything uh, in anywhere our listeners can find you online? That now would be the time. Uh, you can find me at marcusgorman.com. I also have in all my links to, to break down my plays and my film work. Mm-hmm. Um, currently, I just finished a second draft on a radio play. Um, I'm a part of, so in Seattle, we um, a friend of mine, Andrew Shanks, created and produced a, 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 a speculative fiction anthology podcast called The Ugly Radio, which you can find any, anywhere podcasts are. We are in season two. I wrote- okay mostly anthology, like one X, like fantasy or sci-fi, but I have written a full length. I wasn't supposed to, but I got away with a a full length radio play called Space Race 5000, (laughs) which is the cannibal run slash wacky races in space. Wow. So what do you mean by a full length radio play? What does that mean? um, Currently, um, hopefully this doesn't change. It's it's 93 pages long. Oh, wow. Um, We're going to split it over two episodes. Okay. Um, right now, they are set to be released August 6th and August 13th. Okay. Who knows that might change? I only delivered the second draft 
a week ago. Oh, cool. Actually, so how, do, how is that produced, Marcus? You have, do you guys get together and hire actors to perform it? How does that work? So um, it is an ensemble of uh, Seattle-based uh, theater performers. Okay. And he created the Ugly Radio during quarantine, during the pandemic. So everybody's been recording at their own houses and apartments, and he has been editing them together. This is the first time we're doing a full length because he offered me a full length. Mm -hmm. And then I delivered a script that is twice as long as he asked for <laughs> because I liked it too much. And then I brought in um, a, a co-writer friend. We wrote a sci-fi play called Peggy, the plumber who saved the galaxy. I brought him in to punch it up last week. Oh, cool. So, so did, did you find a cliffhanger for like page 45? <laughs> um, it, it's around page 60, unfortunately. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we'll have to work on that. Um, but no, so it, it is, I, I wrote a, I wrote a podcast cartoon film about idiots racing through space. And so it's both, as usual, my stuff is sort of a pastiche slash parody of genre, but also a love letter to them um, to say, to use the cliche, because I love science fiction and I love weird cartoons. So it starts off as a comedy and then slowly gets more serious, which is my shtick, which I did not intend to do over the last 10 years as a playwright and a writer. Um, but so <laughs> now that now that Seattle is like 70% vaccinated, uh -huh. I think we can get some people in the room together. So mm -hmm. um because when you're doing a radio play and it's not live, it's hard to cut dialogue together. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two announcers, of course, who are you know um, flinging one lines one liners at each other. And if they're not in the same room, that's going to be a pain in the ass for the sound designer who is right. not me. Mm -hmm. So, but he assured me that that'll be okay. So we'll start recording it soon. We'll have a reading pretty soon. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully I'm not jinxing it by talking about it so much, but Space Race, Space Race 5000 Space coming Race to 5, you this August. Okay, well, we will check that out. That's so cool. That's so innovative, Marcus. You know, I'm over here. I'm just plugging away writing novels and doing the podcast and you're writing full length radio plays and doing all this cool theater work. I'm so impressed with everything you're doing. I would love Thank to you. come up to Seattle at some point and, you know, see one of your plays in person or, you know, I would love something like that. You're not that far away from me, you know? <laughs> and I have, I have three other plays in various stages of development, mm -hmm. but I shouldn't talk about any of them because those developments all sort of went on pause a year and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> well, keep at it. Keep doing what you're doing, Marcus. Really mm -hmm. fantastic stuff. So thanks for being on my podcast again today to talk about carnal knowledge. And thanks to all of you for listening. You can find us online at filmat50.com or on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And until next time, remember, 50 never looked this good. <laughs>